You are listening to Letter Interrupted by Elizabeth Adams, narrated by Bridget Laurie. Chapter 1. Lambton, Derbyshire, August 1812. Elizabeth tied her bonnet ribbons in a jaunty bow to the left of her face. She did not think she was being too vain by recognising the style to be rather flattering on her. They had plans to walk to the church this morning and call on an old friend of Mrs. Gardner's. Elizabeth did not think it likely she would see Mr. Darcy before dinner at Pemberley this evening, but she had not expected to see him when she called on his sister the day before— nor had she expected to see him at the inn the very day of his sister's arrival, yet she had. So she took extra care with her hair, wore her most flattering walking dress, and tied her bonnet bow thrice before she was satisfied. They were stepping out of the inn when they saw Mr. Darcy walking towards them. Elizabeth felt a little thrill. She had been right to dress carefully— and she gifted him with a bright smile. He returned it, looking somewhat dazed, and addressed her uncle. Are you on your way out? Elizabeth stifled a smile. They were clearly on their way out, though she supposed it was possible they were on their way in, from a very early appointment. We were just going to walk down to the church. Will you not join us? said Mr. Gardner jovially. "'Thank you, I will.' Darcy fell into step beside Elizabeth, the gardeners walking ahead of them. "'I am surprised to see you this morning, Mr. Darcy.' He looked about nervously, and she pretended not to notice it. Or perhaps she truly did not, for she continued to cast nervous glances at her shoes and the shop windows around them. "'I had business in the area.' She nodded. They walked another few minutes in silence before Mr. Darcy sighed. Miss Bennet, I do not like disguise. Yes, I know. I had no business in Lambton other than to see you. Oh? I had hoped to take you for a drive in the country, if you are amenable. A drive? Why could she not string together a full sentence? I have brought my coracle. He looked over his shoulder. I left it at the inn. Elizabeth noted with some relief that he was as nervous as she was. Oddly, it had the effect of soothing her nerves. A drive sounds lovely. I will ask my aunt. Darcy nodded and they followed her relations into the churchyard. Mrs. Gardner told them about the church building itself and her memories of it from her childhood. Her father had been the curate there before being offered a living further south, and she had fond memories of the village and this building in particular. Elizabeth listened with a warm smile, for she was close to her aunt and generally enjoyed hearing about her life before Elizabeth had known her. However, at the moment, her mind was too full of Mr. Darcy to enjoy her aunt's stories. He stood alarmingly close to her, the sleeve of his jacket brushing against her arm when she made the slightest movement. He was speaking of the glass in the windows. His father had ordered new ones when the older ones were blown out in a storm in the year one, but she could not focus on the words. His voice was warm and lilting, like a hot cup of tea on a cold winter's day, and she could not stop her mind from wondering what it would be like to have him read to her by the firelight as she sewed, or perhaps rocked a young babe. Stop it, Elizabeth! You are being ridiculous! Embarrassed by the direction of her own thoughts, she turned away to stand beside her aunt, when the gentleman looked preoccupied, she whispered, Aunt, Mr. Darcy has asked me to go for a drive with him today. Mrs. Gardner turned towards her with raised brows. Did he? Elizabeth flushed at the restrained glee she heard in her aunt's voice. Yes. Would you like to go? 
I do not wish to disrupt your plans. Did you not wish to visit your friend? My dear, do not let my plans deter you. I shall have your uncle with me. I shall hardly feel abandoned. So the question remains, do you wish to go? Elizabeth bit her lip nervously, then met her aunt's gaze as steadily as she could. Yes, I believe I would. Mrs. Gardner smiled and patted her hand. Then, so you should. Mr. Darcy is a fine, upstanding gentleman. He would do very well for you. Elizabeth looked heavenward. Not you, too. Mrs. Gardner laughed softly. I notice you do not disagree with me. Elizabeth felt heat suffuse her face. I do not say you would do well because he is wealthy and grand, though he certainly is. I say it because his mind is well matched to yours, and I believe your temperaments would do well together. Do you? Suddenly Elizabeth was wild to know her aunt's thoughts on the matter. Yes, he could do with some of your liveliness, and I do not think he is the sort of man who would resent you for being more charming than he is. No, I do not think he is, she mused. Elizabeth had never thought about it before, but might a man feel that way? Would her lively talents make her husband, imaginary creature though he was, feel inferior in some way? It was almost laughable, but then she thought about the couples she knew, about how her father made her mother feel inferior due to his greater intelligence. They had not successfully managed their differences. She had seen Lady Lucas look at her husband with something approaching resentment. It was usually when Sir William was welcoming a crowd into their home. Would Lady Lucas have preferred to do things differently? Did she resent her husband's overt affability? Oh dear, Elizabeth was embarrassed that she had never thought of it before. What of her Uncle Philip's? Shaking her head slightly to clear it of all the unpleasant thoughts suddenly assaulting her, Elizabeth focused her attention back to her aunt. Do you like him, Mr. Darcy? Yes, I do. He is a very pleasant young man, intelligent, affable. Indeed, I see no improper pride in him. Neither do I. Not any more. She agreed with a wistful look at Mr. Darcy. Elizabeth, is there something you wish to tell me? No, aunt, though... I thank you for releasing me this afternoon. I shall return in time to dress for dinner. Mrs. Gardner looked at her shrewdly before nodding. Very well. Have a good time, my dear. Darcy's curricle was a modern, fashionable vehicle. Elizabeth felt somewhat nervous as he handed her up into it. She told herself it was because she had never ridden in such a conveyance— but in truth it was because she was willingly placing herself in Mr. Darcy's company, alone, for what would likely be a few hours. He drove them out of the village, neither of them saying a word, though Darcy did nod or tip his hat to several people they passed. Soon they were trundling along a narrow road beside a picturesque row of chestnut trees, a small brook gurgling on the other side. Feeling the weight of the silence, Elizabeth said, Derbyshire is a very pretty country. I see why you love it. Belatedly, she realized he had never said any such thing, but she had assumed he loved it, based on his demeanor and the way he spoke about his home. Thank you. I think so, but I am partial to my home county, as I'm certain you are partial to Hertfordshire. It is true that Hertfordshire is beautiful to me, but it does not preclude me from finding other counties equally lovely. He smiled, but said nothing. Feeling that the weight of conversation would be on her, and likely would always be if she were to make a life with this man, she said, Tell me of growing up here. He looked startled. 
Come, Mr. Darcy, you have known me many months now. Surely it cannot be so terrible to tell me a few stories of your childhood. Yes, it has been many months now, hasn't it? His voice was wistful, and she wished the day to remain light and happy, so she said, Did you used to climb trees with your friends? I believe I heard you mention a horse chestnut tree to my aunt. Yes, there was such a tree in the village green of Lambton until very recently. The boys on the estate and I used to race to it across the fields. Did you ever win the races? Sometimes. There were often larger boys with longer legs and they quickly outpaced me. By the time I was eleven, though, I was winning more often than not. She smiled at the pride she heard in his voice. Should I take that to mean you were a tall boy? He smiled endearingly. Tall and gangly. I was all knees and elbows until I was at least fifteen. And a head taller than the other children. That too, he said with a wry smile. I was terribly clumsy. Mother said it was because I grew so quickly. I could not adapt to a new height before I had achieved yet another. Elizabeth laughed. I dare say your mother was correct. I am not nearly so tall nor even the tallest of my sisters, but what height I have I achieved rather quickly. I remember thinking all the furniture was oddly placed for how often I ran into it. Darcy smiled at her. I know exactly what you mean. I was in the middle of my growth when Georgiana was born. I remember being afraid I would drop her in my clumsiness. Oh dear, that would have been much worse than the vase I broke in the dining room. Yes, my father would have made me clean the stables for a month had I done such a thing. Was that his preferred punishment, mucking the stalls? She silently mused that it would have been a terrible punishment for someone as fastidious as Mr. Darcy. She had never met a man more committed to cleanliness in his dress and person. Yes, until he discovered that I had come to enjoy the activity. Her brow shot up. I see you are surprised. I did not enjoy the shoveling itself, but there is satisfaction in seeing a job completed so clearly. What had been a mess was now clean. The horses that needed care had received it. She nodded in comprehension. I can see how that would be satisfying. It did leave my father in difficult straits in terms of what my punishment should be, though. Were you so often in need of punishment? He smiled at her teasing tone. Not so very often. But an adolescent boy will get into trouble, and I had to be made to see the error of my way somehow. Dare I ask what he devised? Darcy flushed, and Elizabeth smiled delightedly. Do not withhold from me now, Mr. Darcy. I am all curiosity. Darcy sighed, and Elizabeth only smiled wider, making him chuckle and shake his head at her. You are incorrigible, Elizabeth. And I am waiting to hear your tale, Mr. Darcy. She did not comment on his use of her given name, nor did she truly register he had done it until some time later. Very well. Fitz, Colonel Fitzwilliam, that is, was visiting for the summer. He would often spend the summer at Pemberley when he was younger, along with his younger brother. The three of us had the unfortunate tendency of riling one another up. I'm afraid we got into more trouble together than we ever would have done on our own. That does not sound so very unusual. Yes, well... One of Pemberley's tenants, Jacob Turner, was raising sheep at the time. He was very proud of his flock. They were a rare breed and all healthy. The wool fetched high prices at market. Of course, we were not thinking of that at the time. He made a face and Elizabeth grimaced in sympathy. She already felt sorry for the poor sheep. Fitz thought it would be funny to shave some of the wool off in the shape of words. Words? Very particular words that would not be appropriate to speak to a lady. <laughs>
Darcy shifted uncomfortably as Elizabeth stifled a laugh. And some shapes. Oh, dear. Quite. She laughed fully now, unable to contain it. What did your father say when he discovered it? He was angrier than I had ever seen him, and quite rightly. We had cost Mr. Turner a part of his income and embarrassed the family. He lectured us for a full half hour. I can imagine, she said, unable to keep the amusement from her voice. My cousin Jonathan, Fitz's brother, tried to say it was not us, but the fact that he had put his initials on one of the U's put paid to that. A laugh bubbled out of her. I am sorry, I should not laugh, but truly he thought no one would notice. Apparently not. Dare I ask what your punishment was for this infraction? Father made... All three of us work every day for Mr. Turner for the remainder of the summer. Truly? Her eyes widened. She had not thought a man such as Mr. Darcy would have ever been made to do such work. Truly. We hauled buckets of water and feed, learned to direct the dogs, and worked in the neighbouring field where grain was being grown. And... Did you come to like this work as you had the work in the stables? He sucked in a breath. I did not. She bit her lip to hold in her laugh. But I did learn the value of not damaging another's property or source of income, and while the work was not particularly enjoyable, it helped me to understand the farmers and tenants better. I can imagine, though... To this day, Mr. Turner will not let me anywhere near his sheep. Truly! I saw him a few days ago as I rode the estate. He moved in front of his flock like a hen guarding her chicks and stared at me until I had ridden past. She could hold her laughter no longer and released it with a shudder of her shoulders. Darcy watched her with an odd smile on his face. What? Why do you look at me so? I have always loved your laugh. Have you? I thought you found me rather vulgar. Far from it. He continued to stare at her intensely, then reached up and touched a curl resting on her forehead, caressing it gently before pulling his hand back. She did not recoil or rail at him or slap him, but a delicate blush stole across her cheeks. Emboldened, he said, Elizabeth, Miss Bennet, you are too generous to trifle with me. If your feelings are what they were last April, tell me at once and I will never speak of this again. She swallowed and met his eyes, her own shining with what he hoped was pleasure. If your feelings have changed, I hope you will afford me the opportunity to show you that I have seen to your reproofs, and that my most fervent wish is that you might find your way to care for me and accept me one day, as your husband. He swallowed, nervousness filling his entire body. She continued to stare at him without blinking, and he was in agony, wondering what she would say. Why did she not speak? Elizabeth? She jolted as if she had been in a trance. Then her eyes met his again, and hers were shining. Not the angry glitter he had once mistaken for interest, but with a warm glow. Mr. Darcy, my feelings are so very different from what they were last April that I cannot think of my past behaviour without abhorrence. I am so very ashamed of how I acted towards you and the words I said to you. She ducked her head and sighed. He placed a finger beneath her chin and gently tilted her head up till he could see her eyes. What did you say of me that was not true? You had been misinformed, but you were correct about my behaviour. I was proud and haughty and above my company. But you are so much more than that, she cried. 
hope flared in his eyes, and he said, Do you truly mean that, Elizabeth? She nodded vigorously. I would very much like to come to know you better, Mr. Darcy. She flushed and looked down. I look forward to it. Darcy felt elated and shocked and filled with more hope than he had felt in years. Elizabeth. She looked up, and he could not help the broad smile that overtook his features. May I call you Elizabeth? She chuckled. You already have. But yes, you may use my given name. He took up both her hands and kissed them one after another, until she was smiling and laughing and shaking her head at him. Mr. Darcy, who knew you could be so ebullient? She teased. I am usually not, but you make me very happy, my love. I am glad to hear it. She could not make such bold statements herself yet, but she did wish to give him something, so she said, Do you wish for me to call you Fitzwilliam? His smile brightened. If you wish, or you may call me Wills, as my family does. Wills. Fitzwilliam. Wills. She tested the name, seeing which she preferred the sound of, and Darcy stared at her, hardly able to believe he was not dreaming. Was he really in a curricle in a grove with Elizabeth Bennet, having just secured her permission to court her and make his proposals? He could not believe his good fortune. I think I will call you Wills for every day, but I shall reserve Fitzwilliam for special occasions, or when I am cross with you. He kissed her hand again, twisting their forearms together so there was twice as much contact as necessary for the act. I have never before looked forward to someone being cross with me, but I think I might like being lectured by you. Fitzwilliam! She swatted his arm and he laughed happily. I see you are beginning already. She smiled wryly and pulled back to her side of the curricle. How had she gotten so far over? We should drive on, don't you think? Darcy smiled and adjusted the reins. As you wish, my dear. Chapter Two Elizabeth returned to the inn with barely enough time to dress for dinner. She saw she had two letters from Jane, but knew she would not have time to read them before they left for Pemberley. As the maid was arranging her hair, in a simple style in deference to the time, she opened the first letter that had been misdirected. Jane spoke of parties and the gardener children and what their sister Mary was learning on the pianoforte. Elizabeth read between the lines to understand that Mary was butchering a new piece of music her uncle had brought from town, but she was trying so very hard that Jane did not have the heart to ask her to stop. Assuming the remainder of the letter would be more of the same, Elizabeth set it down when her aunt entered the room. Lizzie, do you want to wear my pearl necklace? Mrs. Gardner had a lovely gold chain with three pearl drops dangling from different points at the end. It was very elegant and the only fine jewellery Mrs. Gardner had brought with them. Do you not wish to wear it? I think it more important that you look impeccable this evening. Do you not agree? Elizabeth flushed at the knowing look in her eyes and said, Thank you, aunt. I believe you are correct. Mrs. Gardner nodded and checked the maid's work, then dismissed her and latched the necklace around Elizabeth's neck herself. You seem to have enjoyed your ride with Mr. Darcy today, she said. Yes, it was enjoyable. He told me all about the area. Did you know the river running through the town originates in a Scottish lock? Mrs. Gardner shot her a look in the mirror. As a matter of fact, I did. Did you know that Mr. Darcy is terribly in love with you? Elizabeth flushed and lowered her eyes. As a matter of fact, I did. You have been very sly, Lizzie, 
I did not mean to be, Aunt, honestly. When I last saw him in April, we had a terrible quarrel, and I did not think his affection could withstand such an insult. I was very surprised by his behaviour when we arrived. That much was clear. But, my dear, if it is truly love and not some silly infatuation, a quarrel will not destroy it. Amends may need to be made, but it can be done, and the love can be all the stronger for it. You are wise, aunt. I suppose now would be the time to tell you that Mr. Darcy has asked to court me and eventually make his proposals. Mrs. Gardner's eyes widened comically. Oh, Lizzie, truly? Yes, aunt, truly. Her aunt sank onto the bed, her expression dazed. Finally, after another minute of silence, she stood and said, You must definitely wear the pearls and my new gloves as well. That is not necessary, aunt. My gloves are perfectly serviceable. Elizabeth, said her aunt sternly, this is Pemberley. Serviceable will not do. The drawing-room at Pemberley had roughly a dozen people, though Elizabeth only recognised Mr Bingley's party. Mr Darcy greeted her and her relations with warmth and led them about the room, introducing them to those they were not known to. He kept his free hand over Elizabeth's on his arm and his attentive behaviour did not go unnoticed. In between introductions, Mr. Darcy leaned down to whisper in her ear, "'Shall I speak with your uncle this evening?' "'You may,' she returned, her cheeks stained pink. Darcy smiled in a self-satisfied manner, but she could not bring herself to be irritated with him. She was feeling rather satisfied herself, and if others thought them smug, what of it?' Mr. Darcy seated her beside himself at dinner, and Elizabeth was constantly surprised by his verbosity. He spoke to her of music and the countryside and places he had travelled. He included the woman on his other side, a Mrs. Carlton from a neighbouring estate. That woman seemed very keen on getting to know Elizabeth, and it was not hard to imagine why. She knew enough of Darcy to know he did not pay such attention to ladies as he was doing with her now. His neighbours would understand what it meant, and as the assumed future mistress, they would wish to know her. Thinking of herself as the mistress of Pemberley, even in some nebulous future date, made her feel nearly giddy. It was a magnificent estate, and he was such a man— she could not but feel happy at the notion of spending all her days in a like manner, in this house, with this man's company. Mr. Darcy happened to look over at her as she was daydreaming, and she gifted him with such a bright smile that he was rather dazed for the next several minutes. Mrs. Carlton smiled at his smitten behaviour and filed it all away to tell the other ladies of the neighbourhood they had been waiting a long time for Pemberley to have a mistress. "'May I speak with you, Mr. Gardner?' Darcy asked after the ladies had left the dining-room. The men were milling slowly towards the library, where they would have brandy and discuss the problems of the world— once they were settled in, Darcy led Mr. Gardner off to his study. "'What do you wish to speak to me about? "'I have asked Miss Elizabeth's permission to court her and been granted it. "'I now ask you the same.' "'Mr. Gardner's brows shot up at the younger man's directness. "'I see. And she has agreed, you say? "'Yes, I asked this afternoon.' I see. May I ask why you are pursuing my niece? I assume your intentions are honourable. Of course, Darcy said stiffly. Mr. Gardner nodded. I am glad to hear it. So I ask again, why Elizabeth? I love her, Darcy replied stiffly. Stiffly. 
I believe our temperaments are well suited and we will do well together. He looked away and his voice softened. I have lived without her for some months now. I do not ever wish to do so again. Mr. Gardner nodded. I see. He stood and offered his hand to Darcy. You have my permission and my blessing, not that you asked for it, but I agree with you. I think you and Lizzie would do very well together. Darcy smiled at him as he shook his hand. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. I am pleased to hear you think so. Pemberley kept country hours, so by the time the dinner party broke up, it was not yet fully dark. Mr. Darcy invited Elizabeth and the gardeners to stay for supper, but they had plans to visit the Abbey on the morrow, and they wished for an early start. Darcy pressed Elizabeth's hand as he helped her into the carriage, and she smiled sweetly at him before they pulled away. At the inn, her aunt wished to retire early, and they ordered a cold supper to be brought in an hour before separating to attend to their own activities. Elizabeth happily took up Jane's letters, thinking how astonished her sister would be when Elizabeth told her of her arrangement with Mr. Darcy. This made her think of that gentleman's separation of Jane and Bingley, and she reminded herself to speak to Mr. Darcy about it when he collected her for a drive tomorrow afternoon. She curled into the chair by the window and unfolded Jane's first letter, skimming down the page to find where she had left off. She smiled as Jane described the youngest gardener child, Margaret, a precocious little girl only four years of age, chasing a goose by the pond, but ending up being chased in return. Jane could tell a story with exact details, and she did so with aplomb. Elizabeth was still smiling when she turned the page over. She was not more than a paragraph in before all the colour left her face. Was Jane in jest? Had Lydia eloped? Elizabeth fumbled with the second letter until the seal was broken and eagerly read its contents. It was true! Lydia had eloped with Mr. Wickham. She had left all her friends, disregarded everything she had ever been taught, all to be the first of her sisters married. Petty, stupid girl! She could not know what kind of man he was, but she had as good as tied herself to him for the remainder of her life, if he could be prevailed upon to marry her. Elizabeth stumbled out of her room and pounded on her aunt's door. Aunt, uncle, it is the most dreadful news. Mr. Gardner opened the door in his shirt sleeves, his feet unshod. What is it, Lizzie? It is Lydia. She has run off with Mr. Wickham. They have been traced to London and no further. How will they ever be found? What? Mr. Gardner reddened, and Elizabeth handed the paper to her aunt, who read Jane's letters aloud. We are now eager to know they have been wed, for there is fear Scotland was never Mr. Wickham's destination. Mrs. Gardner read with growing horror. She cannot know what he is. He will never marry her. She has nothing to tempt him. She is ruined. Elizabeth sunk onto the chair and buried her face in her hands. We are all ruined. Elizabeth began to cry, hot, angry tears. How could Lydia have done such a foolish thing? How could she be so selfish? She knew elopements were scandalous. She had gossiped with glee only last summer when an acquaintance, who had once visited the Longs, had run off with a man. She rejoiced in the little idiot's ruin and stupidity. Yet only a year later she was doing the same herself? What was she thinking? The gardeners were bustling about, packing their trunks and making verbal lists of notes that needed to be sent. 
Mrs. Gardner sat at the desk to begin writing to her acquaintance in Lambton, informing them of her abrupt departure, but being deliberately vague on the reasons why. Elizabeth felt she was seeing it all from the outside, as if she were not truly present for the mayhem she was currently embroiled in, but a casual observer. She smiled darkly at the irony of her aunt and uncle's positions. Mrs. Bennet was a silly woman, but she had done very well for herself in life. She was the daughter of a tradesman, yet she married a gentleman and became the matriarch of the principal family in the area. It had been a good connection for the gardeners, one they could be proud of. Now it would be a source of shame. They may even find themselves forced to cast off the entire Bennet family to protect the reputations of their own children. Elizabeth released a strangled laugh. Mr. and Mrs. Gardner were speaking more calmly now, the shock of the revelation wearing off. It cannot be as bad as we assume. He knows Lydia is not wholly unprotected. He cannot be so foolish, said her uncle in a tone that hinted he was trying to convince himself. He may truly care for her. Aunt Gardner sounded sceptical. She was clearly trying to cling to whatever shred of optimism she could. Elizabeth laughed again, the sound a strange gurgle in her throat. Her aunt and uncle stopped and turned toward her, surprise and concern on their faces. He will not marry her, not without financial gain to himself. Wickham is a lying, scheming, selfish monster, and he is certainly the sort of man who would take a girl from her friends and ruin her reputation simply because he did not wish to be alone. Monsters never like their own company. Her voice was dark, and hot tears streamed relentlessly down her cheeks. Lizzie, I think it is time you tell us everything you know of Mr. Wickham, said her uncle. Of course. Why should I not? Everything is lost now regardless. She told them Wickham was no gentleman, that he left debt and ruin wherever he went, that he had tried to elope with an heiress before and been thwarted. He has no conscience, no scruples, no sense of decency. He cares for nothing but his own comfort and his selfish desires. He will not marry her, but even if he did, he would make her life a misery. Mrs. Gardner sank into a chair with a loud exhale. What are we to do? We must return to London. I will help Bennet with the search. Wickham must marry her, said Mr. Gardner. And if he does not? Mrs. Gardner looked at him beseechingly. Then we must find her a husband by other means. Chapter 3 Elizabeth pressed the last dress into her trunk and sat at the small desk, having no more excuses to avoid the letter she knew she must write. With a sigh and a heart filled with regret, she put her pen to paper. My dear Mr. Darcy, please excuse the impropriety of this letter, but I could not leave Derbyshire without explaining my absence to you. My youngest sister Lydia has been visiting Brighton with her friend Mrs. Forster, whose husband is the colonel of the regiment recently quartered in Meryton. Mrs. F. is a silly thing, barely older than Lydia, and, as it appears, a poor chaperone. I wish I did not have to tell you this, for it lays waste to all my hopes. But my younger sister Lydia has eloped. She has left all her friends in Brighton and thrown herself into the power of Mr. Wickham. I know it must pain you to read his name. It is no less a degradation for me to write it. But the truth cannot be concealed for long, though I must ask you to conceal it as long as possible. We will leave Lambton in the morning, and I fear I shall never see you again.' 
I understand all too well why our acquaintance must come to an end. It pains me deeply to know I will no longer see your customary scowl, nor have the pleasure of teasing it off your handsome visage. I will cherish your memory all my days, and I will never forget the honour you have paid me with your affection. I know it is improper, but as I am soon to be an outcast from society, I will take this opportunity to say that in these last few days I have felt more for you than any other man I have ever known. I feel the promise of the love we could have shared as it slips through my grasp, and I am deeply grieved. I would have loved you, Fitzwilliam, more than any wife has ever loved her husband. You are the man in disposition and talents most suited to me. Of all the gentlemen I have known, only you have taken root in my heart. I must take comfort from the idea that you will always reside there, safe from the aggravations of daily life. In my memory, you will always be the dashing young man who took me for a drive in the country on a summer's afternoon, who told me amusing stories and touched my cheek so tenderly, who asked to court me with such sincerity and humility. We will forever be frozen in August. I will never become angry with you for spoiling our precocious daughter or wishing to stay in when I want to go out. You will never be silent for days at a time because I was impertinent to you in public. We will be spared these little injuries, and our affection may remain sweet and untested. When you do marry, lock me away in a corner of your heart, and give what is left of it to your bride. You may remember me in August, for one day only, and I will be forever young and happy in your memories. Farewell. My almost love, your Elizabeth. Elizabeth sanded the letter and dried her tears, then sealed it and addressed it to Mr. Darcy of Pemberley. She had never regretted her refusal so much as she did now. Had she accepted him in April, they would have been married by now. Perhaps they would have been on their wedding tour, and she would not have even known of Lydia's foolishness, Perhaps if Lydia had not had the inducement of being the first daughter wed, she would not have taken such a foolhardy step. Elizabeth sighed and rose from the desk. She found the maid in the sitting room setting out a cold supper. They had ordered it more than an hour ago, but she had no recollection of doing so. It felt as if she had lived months since dinner, not hours. "'Would you have this sent to Pemberley?' she asked the maid, holding out the letter. "'Of course, miss. Would you like it sent tonight?' "'Tomorrow is soon enough.' She smiled at the eager maid and forced herself to eat a few bites. She would need her strength in the coming days. The maid tucked the letter into her apron and made her way to the kitchen, Young Jimmy Turner sat at a table near the fire, making eyes at Mina, the kitchen maid. I go heading back to Pemberley tonight. Aye, I'll be off in a few minutes. Might you take this letter to the main house? It be for Mr Darcy. He nodded and tucked the letter into his pocket. Young Turner smiled and winked at the kitchen maid, then mounted his horse and rode for Pemberley. By a stroke of luck, Mr. Darcy was returning from an evening stroll and walked toward the drive when he passed by. "'What do you do here?' he called. "'It be Jimmy Turner, sir. I have a letter from the inn.' He came to a stop and Mr. Darcy reached for the letter the lad was holding out. Darcy pressed a coin into the young man's hand and made his way to the house. He bypassed the drawing-room where he could hear Miss Bingley's nasal voice drifting into the hall and made for a sitting-room at the back of the house. He lit a candle and broke the seal, not recognising the handwriting but hoping the letter was from Elizabeth. He did not know who else would write him from the inn. He was only half-way through when he sank into a chair with a gasp, then sprang up a minute later to pace across the room. Wickham! 
What was the man thinking? Surely he knew the Bennets could give him nothing substantial. Had he truly cared nothing for ruining an entire family of sisters? A family he had called friend and who had shown him considerable hospitality. What did he have to gain from it? Was he truly so lost to decency? Darcy paced again, his mind whirring at incredible speeds. He must assist them. If Wickham had disappeared into London, they might never find him. Desperate to do something, Darcy made his way to his study. He wrote a letter to a man who did some investigative work for him from time to time and asked if he was aware of the current whereabouts of Mrs. Young, Georgiana's former companion. He also asked the man if he had any ideas about Wickham, but he was less hopeful for a positive response. He then sent a letter to his London housekeeper, saying he would be in residence shortly and mentioning that he might have guests, though he did not know precisely when or how many. He drafted a letter to Mr. Bennet, asking permission to marry Miss Elizabeth, but did not send it. He was not sure if he would need it. He would prefer to speak to the man face to face, but he wished to be prepared. He then wrote a short note to Mr. Gardner, offering his assistance. And finally, he began a letter to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, I understand why you would feel the need to act as you have and release me from any obligation to you, but I must tell you now that I have no wish to be released. You have made me happier these last few days than I have ever been in my life, and I refuse to give you up. I will think of you in August and every other day of every month, for I cannot do otherwise. I would give you anything that was in my power to give, but I cannot give you that. Ask anything else of me, and it is yours." I have written to your uncle to offer my assistance, and I offer the same to you now. I will help locate your sister in any way I may. I would hope she would leave Wickham's power, for he will make a dreadful husband, though I understand marriage may be the only option. But whatever the solution, we shall weather it together, my love. We will find a way." I shall see you in the morning before you depart. I remain yours, F.D. He sealed the letter and summoned a servant to deliver it, and then sent for Bingley. The conversation would be unpleasant, but he had waited long enough. Chapter 4 Bingley entered Darcy's study with an inquisitive look. Are you well, Darcy? You look a bit... He trailed off with a wave in Darcy's direction, encompassing his friend's overall unkempt appearance. I am well, Bingley, but I have received unpleasant news. Is your family well? Yes, everyone is in good health, but I must tell you a few things, and that will be more easily done with a brandy and your agreement to hear me out. Of course... I will hear whatever you have to say. You may regret agreeing when you hear all. Darcy poured his friend a brandy and took a sip from his own glass. I have a confession to make. Last autumn, when I told you I believed Miss Bennet to be indifferent to you, I was mistaken. Bingley blinked at him in astonishment. Mistaken? Yes. Utterly. I have it on the best authority that Miss Bennet had strong feelings for you and was heartbroken when you left Hertfordshire. Bingley leaned back into his chair, his features frozen. After a few minutes of silence, he sat forward and said, Miss Elizabeth is your source of information, is she not? Yes, she is. I'm sure you will agree she is better placed to know her sister's heart than I am. Yes, of course, of course, Bingley murmured, leaning back with a thoughtful expression, then sprang up to walk behind his chair. 
He began to speak more than once, but never got past a few words. How could... He paced to the window. What were... He paced to the fireplace. Why would you... More pacing to the door. Did she... Back to the window again. How is it... He placed his hands on the back of the chair and clenched his fingers into the upholstery. Then, finally, Why ever did you think her indifferent? Darcy sighed. I watched her the evening of the Netherfield Ball. She seemed happy enough, but not particularly pleased by your company. She showed the same expression to nearly everyone she met. She is kind, cried Bingley. I know being courteous to mere acquaintances would be torturous for you, but there are some who do not find it quite so odious. Darcy cringed at his friend's biting tone. He knew he deserved Bingley's censure, but it did not follow that he would enjoy it. He fought back the urge to defend himself. He had been acting in Bingley's best interest after all. Hadn't he? There is more, Darcy said eventually. Bingley stopped pacing and looked up. What? I have received Miss Elizabeth's consent to court her. I spoke with her uncle after dinner. Bingley's eyes bulged. You did what? I am now officially courting Miss Elizabeth, and I intend to one day soon make my proposals. Again. Bingley scoffed. Just when I think you cannot surprise me further, you exceed my expectations. He glared at his friend for a moment, but he did not have the countenance for it and looked more like an angry child than a grown man taking his oldest friend to task. So all your talk about fortune and connections was rot? You only said it to get me to abandon Miss Bennet? He laughed cynically and paced away, a hand running through his hair and along the back of his neck. No, I did not lie to you, Bingley. The Bennets' situation is not desirable, that is true, but I have come to believe that it is not as important as I once thought it. Bingley stared at his friend, taking in his flushed face, his quick breath, the nervous tapping of his finger on his leg. You are in love with her. Darcy looked toward the darkened window. Of course he was in love with her. Why else would he ask to court her? You are well and truly smitten added Bingley, a smile beginning to work its way across his face. After all these years, who knew it would be a country girl from Hertfordshire who would argue her way into your heart? Darcy was about to maintain that they had not been arguing, not truly, but caught himself in time. He had not been arguing. He had enjoyed the stimulating debates Miss Elizabeth so effortlessly provided. But he now knew that she had, in fact, been arguing with him. She had likely thought him an arrogant fool the entire time. It was a sobering recollection. Regardless of how we began, we have come to share a mutual respect and regard. Bingley looked at him suspiciously. Darcy did not speak like any man in love he had ever known. But then Darcy was not like any other man he knew, and said, I congratulate you. Miss Elizabeth is a fine lady. I'm certain you shall do very well together. Thank you, Bingley. Your blessing means a great deal to me. Bingley looked surprised for a moment. Then he smiled and said, Do you have any more surprises for me this evening? It has been such an eventful day. I would prefer to get it all out now. Bingley was smiling, clearly thinking he had made a clever joke. But Darcy could not avoid the wince that tightened his shoulder. Tell me, Bingley, what will you do about Miss Bennet?' 
Bingley took a deep breath. I know you will say I should think on it longer, but I know what I wish to do. I shall send my sisters to Scarborough and return to Netherfield as I should have done last winter. It will be more difficult without a hostess, but I do not wish to wait. He stared defiantly at Darcy, as if daring him to argue his plan. I think that a wise plan. Miss Bingley is not fond of the Bennets. Bingley frowned. What do you mean? She and Jane were friends. Darcy scoffed. Bingley, your sister was bored, and Miss Bennet was a pleasant diversion. They were not truly friends, at least not on Miss Bingley's side. Bingley looked dismayed and surprised. Darcy fought the urge to roll his eyes. Miss Elizabeth told me that your sister sent Miss Bennet a letter saying you would never return to Netherfield and that you were spending an inordinate amount of time with my sister. Bingley stared at him for a moment. What? Quite. When did she send the letter? The day we left Netherfield. Bingley's eyes widened comically and his face flushed a deep red. She told Miss Bennet, my Jane, that I was courting Miss Darcy? Yes. She is sixteen. Fifteen at the time. Bingley looked as if he would choke on his rage. How could you not tell me? I did not know until today. Miss Elizabeth told me when I took her for a drive. Bingley was mollified slightly by this. Of course. Uh, forgive me, Darcy. It has been an eventful evening. He let his head fall against the back of the chair and closed his eyes with a sigh. Darcy swallowed uncomfortably. I must tell you something else. What is it now? Has Caroline stolen the silver? No, though you will be angry. Bingley warily opened one eye and watched his friend. What is it? Miss Bennet was in town over the winter. Apparently she travelled to London with the gardeners after the festive season. She was there until the end of April. Bingley's eyes grew progressively wider with each word Darcy uttered. She sent Miss Bingley a letter, more than one, I believe, and called on her in town. Bingley sat fully forward now, his elbows on his knees. She did what? Darcy was uncertain if Bingley was referring to his sister or Miss Bennet, but did not stop to inquire. Miss Bingley waited nearly three weeks to return the call, and Miss Bennet was certain by the end of it that the acquaintance was dropped. She was very hurt, according to Miss Elizabeth. Miss Elizabeth told you all of this? Darcy hung his head. Some, yes. But I also knew of Miss Bennet's presence in town from Miss Bingley. She told me Miss Bennet had called on her. I agreed that you should not be informed of the visit. Bingley sprang out of his chair so quickly that Darcy sat back in a rush, the hair on his forehead flying from the movement. You knew she was in town? That she had sought me out, despite everything Caroline had told her? Yes, I am truly sorry, Charles. I never should have done it. It was wrong of me. Yes, it was very, very wrong of you, Darcy. Bingley cried. He paced to the end of the room and back again before he was master of himself enough to speak. Do you know what this means? Darcy nearly opened his mouth, then thought better of it. It means that Miss Bennet was faithful to me despite my capricious behaviour. Darcy's expression showed his confusion. You do not understand, do you? She was told by my sister, a person who ought to know the truth of the matter, that I was pursuing another woman and that I would not return to her. But she did not believe it. 
She believed in what had passed between us, in the love that we shared. She knew I would not abandon her, so she made her way to London to set the record straight. And then she was dismissed by my own sister. Jane must have thought I knew of her visit, for how could I not? If Caroline had not told me, surely the butler would mention it, or I would inquire directly. Surely I would have as much faith in her as she had in me. He laughed cynically. Darcy cringed. It was much worse than he had imagined. He had expected anger, but Bingley seemed broken, as if his perpetual happiness had abandoned him utterly. Bingley, all is not lost. I believe Miss Bennet still cares for you. But does she trust me? He said so quietly, Darcy almost didn't hear him. Bingley, I know it appears bad now, but it can be mended. Miss Bennet is not the kind to move from one love to another in rapid succession. She will love you for many more years to come. There is time to repair her trust. Bingley looked to the floor and sighed. I know what I must do, Darcy. I must throw myself on her mercy and beg for forgiveness. That is likely a good place to start. The cynical laugh returned. I cannot blame you entirely, though, nor Caroline. It was my decision to go to London, my decision to remain there. I could have heard your counsel and made my own choice, but I chose to believe a man who had never been in love, and who knew Jane not at all, instead of trusting my own judgment. The fault lies with me. Darcy sat back, impressed with his friend's realisation and even more so with his rapid progression from surprise to angry to teasing to angry again, then swiftly on to self-knowledge and resolution. You are a better man than me, Bingley. Bingley's head shot up in surprise. Why do you say that? You have quickly resolved all of this in one evening— when I was faced with my own shortcomings, I'm afraid it was weeks before I recognized my culpability. It is hardly resolved, Darcy. I merely see no reason to belabor the point with endless introspection and analysis. I know what I need to do now. There is no benefit to delay. You will propose to Miss Bennet without delay, then? I shall assess her current feelings, but... If she is amenable, I shall make my proposals as soon as I may. His chin was still raised high, and Darcy shook his head a little. Where had Bingley's stubbornness been last winter when he had needed it? But better late than not at all. There is something else that I must tell you. There is some trouble at Longbourn. He quickly confirmed Bingley's discretion and conveyed what he knew of Lydia's elopement— I understand this may change your plans regarding Miss Bennet, said Darcy quietly. Bingley stared at the floor for a moment, then looked up at his friend. My plans are unchanged, Darcy. If I had behaved as I ought, Jane would be my wife now. Miss Lydia might not have done something so drastic if she had had a brother to rely on. For that matter, Wickham may have thought twice if he knew she was more protected. Or he would have ransomed her, mumbled Darcy. Louder, he said, I am pleased to hear you will continue on your path. The Bennet family needs support now more than ever. What do you plan to do? I will go to town and seek them out. Wickham cannot be impossible to find, though it will be difficult. If he does prove elusive, I am certain he will eventually tire of Miss Lydia, and she will appear on her relation's doorstep. Will she not feel too ashamed to return? Darcy could not fully stop his scoff from making itself heard. I doubt Miss Lydia feels much shame at all. If she requires help, she will make her way to the gardener's. 
He pushed down the worry that such a silly girl might not know how to take a cab or even remember her uncle's direction. She was not entirely stupid. He must believe that she would find her way back should it be required. But in what condition would she appear? asked Bingley. That does not bear thinking about, said Darcy grimly. I have an aunt in a remote part of Yorkshire. If necessary, I can take Miss Lydia there. That is good of you, Bingley. Thank you. I have a property in Northumbria I have considered as well. Let us hope we do not need it, but it is good to have a plan in case it is required. Of course. Shall I accompany you to London? I am hoping to prevail on Mr. Gardiner to join me. Your presence would be more useful in Hertfordshire, I think. The news has likely spread, and the Bennets will soon be feeling its effects, if they are not already. Bingley sighed heavily. I suppose you are right. Miss Bennet will be supporting her entire family, and will not give a care to her own health. I am more needed in Hertfordshire. Will you send your brother and sisters on their way to Scarborough tomorrow? I must go to London directly. I will not see them before I depart. Of course. Hurst can accompany them. Will you and Mr. Gardiner travel in your coach? I imagine so, though I may ride. It would be quicker. You'll barely be able to walk by the time you arrive. That is no matter. I shall offer to escort Miss Elizabeth and Mrs. Gardiner to Longbourn then. Thank you, Bingley. That eases my mind. Bingley clapped his arm. Do not worry, Darcy. I shall watch over your lady love. Bingley had gone up to pack, and Darcy had written two more letters before he realised Bingley had never asked him if he would give Miss Elizabeth up. It had never even occurred to him. How was it that Darcy felt both proud and ashamed at the thought? Chapter 5 Elizabeth was preparing for bed when the maid knocked on the door and handed her a letter. Elizabeth took it with confusion and sank onto the mattress, instantly recognising the handwriting. Had they already delivered her letter to Pemberley? Had Mr. Darcy responded so quickly? She eagerly opened the seal and spread the heavy paper on her lap. He still loved her. He would not give her up. Her heart sang at the knowledge that he would stand by her no matter what. She felt a twinge of guilt for bringing such trouble to his door, but the feeling was utterly overshadowed by the joy she felt at knowing she still had his affection. She would be Mrs. Darcy one day. She knew it. To no one's surprise, Mr. Darcy arrived at the inn early the next morning. Elizabeth saw him from the window and stepped into the corridor to greet him without an audience. Miss Bennet. He quickly grasped her hands and brought them to his chest, pulling her closer. How are you this morning? As well as can be expected, though I am happy to see you. He smiled warmly at her. I wish it was under better circumstances. Are you going directly to London? We will stop at Longbourn first. My aunt wishes to see her children, and we will see if there is any news, though I doubt there will be. My uncle will continue on to town. Might I offer my carriage? Your aunt could go to Longbourn and your uncle directly to town. Time is of the essence. Yes, I know. I will suggest it. She squeezed his hands. I am so very glad to see you, Fitzwilliam. He pressed her hands with his own. We will find a way through this, my love. Tell me, do you think your sister might be persuaded to leave Wickham? If she cannot be, my uncle will toss her over his shoulder. I have never seen him as angry as he was last night. Rightly so. I do not know what Wickham was thinking. Is this so unusual for him?' 
I thought he had behaved similarly in the past. He has, but he has never deliberately ruined a gentleman's daughter. He has always acted for his own gain, but he has had some notion of society's rules. I have wondered. His voice trailed off. You wondered what? Have you written to your sister at all? Does she know you are in Derbyshire? She knew we would visit Derbyshire, but I have said nothing of you or Pemberley or even Lambton in any of my letters. My aunt has written to Jane and told her we would be in the area, but Lydia is not a regular correspondent. I'm sure Jane has written to her, but she would have no reason to mention our travels. You are not thinking Wickham meant to get to you through me, are you? He smiled ruefully. I love the quickness of your mind. It would be a roundabout way of doing so, but he has never wasted an opportunity to harm me when it presented itself. Horrid, hateful man, she spat. Yes, well, we may never know what his true motivation was. It is likely he was in need of funds, and your sister would not give up her purse. Let us not discuss it more in the corridor. She opened the door and led him into the sitting room she was sharing with her aunt and uncle. Mr. Darcy has come to see us off. May I speak with you, Mr. Gardiner? Darcy asked. Elizabeth and her aunt went into the bedroom, and Mr. Gardiner looked at Darcy expectantly. I received your note, Mr. Darcy. I must say I am surprised you are standing by Elizabeth, given the circumstances. I would do a great deal more for her. Gardiner nodded. How do you propose we proceed? You said something of knowing Wickham's acquaintance? Yes, he is on good terms with a woman formerly in my employ. She may know where he is. I have already sent out inquiries. Let us hope she has news of him. Do you think it possible Wickham is truly smitten with Lydia and wishes to marry her? He must know she is not unprotected. Again, Darcy wondered if Wickham was trying to strike at him through the Bennet family. It was a big gamble to take. How could he have even been certain Darcy would find out? But Wickham was not averse to gambling. I cannot say for certain, though I think it highly unlikely that his motives are anything but self-serving. He may have taken her with him for no other reason than he wished for a travelling companion, and she had pin money she was willing to part with. Wickham has never appreciated his own company. Gardner snorted. I can't imagine why. Quite. I propose I accompany you to London. Or we might send the ladies on to Longbourn in your carriage. We could travel faster in my coach. I'm sure you understand that the sooner we reach her, the greater the chance of salvaging her reputation. Yes, that is true. I do not wish to inconvenience you, but I see that you are determined. He looked at Darcy shrewdly. And I imagine this is personal for you, is it not? If you mean I have a long overdue reckoning with Wickham, you are not entirely wrong. But my primary motive is Miss Elizabeth's happiness. As I told you last night, I wish to make her my wife one day soon. And that would be more speedily accomplished if she did not have a ruined sister, replied Gardner. As I said, personal motivation. He gave Darcy an understanding smile and said... Very well. I accept your generous offer. I will send my wife and niece on to Longbourn. We can travel more quickly without the ladies. Might I prevail on you for a manservant to accompany them? Bingley has offered to escort them. He will be returning to Netherfield directly. Will he? Hmm... Mr. Gardner said no more, but there was a wealth of information in his expression. Darcy said something noncommittal, and soon they were on their way. He and Elizabeth shared a brief goodbye beside the carriage, and then they were separated.
Elizabeth watched the coach speed off ahead of them and wondered when she would see Mr Darcy again, though she was not truly despondent. There was no one she would trust her future with more. Chapter 6 Longbourn was as Elizabeth had expected, hectic, melancholy and confining. Her aunt was happy to see her children, and after greeting them went to sit with Mrs. Bennet. She had more patience than Elizabeth, who had only managed five minutes with her mother before retreating. Could the woman truly not see that her own insistence that Lydia go to Brighton and have a wonderful time had contributed to her daughter's behaviour? Had she not encouraged Lydia to flirt with the officers at every turn? Had she not made marriage to a handsome man the uppermost priority in her daughter's eyes? Mrs. Bennet was wailing and demanding attention, making an awful situation worse with her selfish behaviour. She cared not that her moans could be heard by every servant in the house, or that her daughters may not wish to cater to her every whim, or sit by her side every moment, listening to her complaints. Elizabeth was so disgusted with her mother, she could not bear to look at her, and realising that fact made her disgusted with herself. Mrs. Bennet was Lydia's mother. Whatever compassion or fear Elizabeth felt for her sister must be magnified tenfold for her mother. She should be more understanding. She should be kinder to Mrs. Bennet. But she could not manage it for more than a few minutes at a time. Aunt, I am come to beg a favour of you, said Elizabeth, as she joined her aunt in the garden where she sat watching her children play. What is it, Lizzie? I know I have no right to request anything of you, especially when you have already taken me on a tour this summer, but I must ask. When you return to London tomorrow, might I accompany you? Mrs. Gardner stared at her niece as she rushed through her request. I do not see why you could not, but do you not wish to remain with Jane? Jane is preoccupied with Mr. Bingley, and she is spending every spare moment with our mother. I am ashamed to admit it, but I do not have the patience to do the same. Mrs. Gardner sighed. I will not pretend I do not understand you. It is a trying time. Very well. Come to London with me. You may be of comfort to your father. Your uncle writes that he is disheartened. It is hardly surprising, but unpleasant nonetheless. Do they make any progress? Mr. Darcy has located the woman whom he believes knows Wickham's whereabouts. They hope she will tell them today where they are hiding. Elizabeth shook her head. Lydia is such a foolish girl. He will make a dreadful husband, and she will be proud to have him. She will. Silly girl. London was as it ever was, but hotter and more odiferous. Elizabeth settled into the gardener's home and waited for her father and uncle to return. Mr. Gardner had left a note that he would be out all day searching for Lydia and would be home late. Elizabeth and Mrs. Gardner were just sitting down for dinner when there was a great commotion at the front door. Put me down! I will not be handled this way! I am not baggage! Put me down! There was a loud thump just before Elizabeth and Mrs. Gardner burst into the entrance hall. Papa! Elizabeth cried. Are you well? Her father was pale and shaking, and she had never seen such an expression on his face. He seemed surprised to see her, then shook his head and ran his hand through his thinning hair. Elizabeth, please assist your sister. Elizabeth looked down and saw Lydia sprawled across the floor, a scowl on her face and her hands balled into fists. Her uncle was standing next to her aunt, who wore a shocked expression. Elizabeth knelt down and placed her hand under her sister's elbow. Come, Lydia, get off the floor. Lydia accepted the assistance, but shook off Elizabeth's hand as soon as she was upright.
I cannot believe you're all so unfeeling. How dare you treat me in such a fashion? How dare you behave like a wanton little strumpet who cares for nothing but a little fun, not even your own reputation, cried Mr. Bennet. I was going to be married. My reputation is excellent, said Lydia, with her pert little nose raised high in the air. Lydia, said Mr. Gardner, in a tone that conveyed his rapidly fading patience, Surely you see that Wickham had no intention of marrying you. If he had, he would have gone to your father. There was no need to elope. Lydia's nose rose higher, and she crossed her arms over her chest. And you did not even elope properly. You were not on the road to Scotland. Wickham had business in London. We would have gone to Scotland soon enough. When? Lydia huffed and turned away from them. Soon. It does not signify when. It signifies a great deal. Did you know that without your father's permission, you would not be given your dowry? Lydia's arms dropped, and she turned to face her uncle. That is not true. My portion is mine. No one can take it from me. Your father most certainly can. And I most certainly would, added Mr. Bennet. You would receive nothing from me, nor would we receive you at Longbourn. You would be a disgrace. Lydia huffed in indignation. Mother would not allow it. Her expression was indignant, but her voice quivered slightly. I am the master of Longbourn, Mr. Bennet bellowed. Lydia looked at her father in surprise, as if she were just realising that she was in trouble. Elizabeth rolled her eyes and took her sister's arm. Come, Lydia, I will help you dress for dinner. She led her sister up the stairs and into the small room she would occupy, Mr. Bennet had the best guest room and Elizabeth the second. She had no intention of giving it up for her spoiled sister. Lydia could make do with a small room next to the nursery. Once Lydia's dirty gown had been removed and Elizabeth had called for bath water, there really was no avoiding the pungent odour Lydia brought with her. She schooled her features and spoke to her sister. Lydia, what made you decide to run off with Mr. Wickham? Don't look at me like that, Lizzie. You're just jealous that Wickham likes me better now. She preened in the mirror, the effect diminished by her frizzy hair and dirty face. Elizabeth could only stare at her until the hip bath was full. She had known Lydia was bad, outrageous, flirtatious and unrepentant, but this refusal to see reality, this inability to even recognise her own filth, brought on by her diminished circumstances, was appalling. Lydia, do you not see that eloping would ruin the entire family? We have small dowries and few connections to begin with. No gentleman of sense would take a woman with a ruined sister. La, how dramatic you are, Lizzie. I am hardly ruined. I would have been married soon enough. When? When Wicky received the money he was owed from his friend, of course. Elizabeth scoffed. She could hold it in no longer. And why would he marry you? What could he possibly gain from such an alliance? Lydia looked insulted. He would gain me. Wickham loves me, she said the last with a flip of her hair. Elizabeth shuddered when she saw the ragged ends of Lydia's hair and the dirt encircling her neck in thin lines. Where have they been staying? Have there been no water to bathe? Have you been washing at all? You are filthy.
Lydia was offering her no courtesy, so why should Elizabeth put herself out to be gentle with her? She would speak as she found. I am not. Besides, the inn quit bringing us water two days ago. Something about not having enough maids. She waved her hand as if it was of no significance that she had not so much as washed her hands, let alone her face, in nearly three days. Or Wickham quit paying them more like. Lydia groaned. Oh, must you be so tiresome, Lizzie? I will invite you to stay with me and Wicky when we are wed, and I shall find you a husband of your own. Then you shall be cheerful again. Elizabeth groaned and left the room. There was no reasoning with her sister. She briefly explained their conversation to her aunt, or rather the lack of reasonable conversation, and suggested Lydia have a tray in her room. Mrs. Gardner agreed, and Elizabeth joined her father and uncle for dinner. "'What will become of her now?' asked Mrs. Gardner. She had dismissed all the servants, and the four of them sat near one another in the dining room, tensely discussing Lydia and attempting to eat, despite the utter nausea-inducing situation. "'If she is increasing, she will have to be sent away,' said Mr. Gardner. "'Mr. Darcy has offered a cottage in Northumbria, and there is another option in Yorkshire.' "'When will we know?' asked Elizabeth. "'You did not ask your sister?' said her father. Elizabeth flushed at the nature of the question, but this was no time to be missish. Her family's respectability depended on the outcome of Lydia's foolish behaviour. She shook her head. No. I will speak to her in the morning, said Mrs. Gardner. It is possible she is safe, but she is very young. It is not unlikely she is increasing. Perhaps we should send her away regardless. She is not fit for society as she is. Mr. Bennet's voice was filled with bitterness. Elizabeth wanted to say that she had told her father Lydia was too young to be out, too silly to be travelling without her family, too flirtatious to be surrounded by an encampment full of young, lonely soldiers. This was bound to happen sooner or later. But one look at her father's grim expression and her desire for her own retribution faded to nothing. She would soon be married and away. Her father would live on at Longbourn, facing all his neighbours and his lifelong friends, with the knowledge that his own daughter had thrown away her family's respectability without a moment's hesitation or a doubt in her mind. It would be humiliating in the extreme. Mr. Darcy has suggested a school for girls with high spirits if we can contain the scandal, said Mr. Gardner. He kept to himself that Mr. Darcy had also thought it unlikely the scandal could be contained. Elizabeth perked up at Mr. Darcy's name. Where is this school? Would they take a girl like Lydia? I think they do not generally take girls who have misbehaved so spectacularly, but I am sure there is more than one who has done as Lydia has, and though perhaps without the added excitement of an escape to London. It is something to consider, though. What would we say to everyone in Meryton? It is no secret she has run off, added Mrs. Gardner. There was a collective sigh as they thought about how to quell the scandal. Oh, Lizzie, I nearly forgot. Mr. Gardner reached into his jacket and pulled out a letter. Mr. Darcy asked me to include this in my next letter to Longbourn, but as you are here, he handed her the letter. Elizabeth nearly snatched it from his fingers, so eager was she. She tucked it into her pocket and spared a look for her father. His expression was inscrutable, but she thought his eyes were sad. Though why would they not be, given all that had occurred? 
Is there any chance Lydia will marry Mr. Wickham? She asked. I doubt it. He will want money, and plenty of it, to marry her. I would rather see it settled on her in a marriage to a respectable farmer than on that lout, said Mr. Gardiner. Lydia will not want to marry a farmer, said Elizabeth. The table shook as Mr. Bennet's fist came down beside his plate. I do not care what Lydia will like. She has thrown away all consideration for her family and polite society. She has made it impossible for a gentleman to wed her. She will make do with what she can manage, and that is that. Elizabeth swallowed hard. She had never seen her father as angry as he had been since she arrived in Gracechurch Street. She felt someone grab her hand and look down to see her Aunt Gardner had reached for her. All will be well, Lizzie, she whispered quietly. To the table, Mrs. Gardner said, So Lydia can go to school if we can find a way to explain her absence and she is not increasing. And if she is, she must either be sent to the country to have the babe and find it a home or be married immediately. Do I have the right of it? Mr. Bennet sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose. You do, Marianne, though I wish it was not so. Gardner reached over and pressed Mr. Bennet's shoulder. I am sorry, brother. It is unthinkable to make such choices for one's own child. Elizabeth was startled to see her father nod and sag a little further. He spent so much time hiding away from them and mocking her younger sisters that without realising she had done it, she had come to believe he did not truly care about Lydia. For the first time, she looked at him as an aggrieved father who would potentially have to banish his own daughter to a far-off land in order to save the other four. Her uncle was right. It was unthinkable. She was the loudest babe I had ever seen, said Mr. Bennet quietly. I remember wondering how so much noise could come from such a small person. Everyone at the table laughed softly. I remember your letter announcing the birth. Your sister has delivered another daughter, and the little one shall not let her forget it, said Mr. Gardner with a melancholy smile. Elizabeth remembered Lydia's birth. She had woken to find the house in uproar, and the maid leading the midwife down the corridor— Mrs. Hill had told her to stay in the nursery and play with Kitty until it was all over. Jane was reading Mary a book, so Elizabeth had dutifully sat with Kitty and her dolls, wondering what her mother's cries portended. And then there had been Lydia. Her mother was suddenly much smaller, and there was a wet nurse in the house. Little had they known Lydia would be the last babe to sleep in the Bennet cradle. Her mother had come down with a fever two days later, and the doctor had told her another confinement could kill her. Thus, Lydia was destined to be the youngest of the Bennet children. Elizabeth had often mused that had her youngest sister been born in the middle, as Mary had been, it might have done her disposition some good. But that was wishful thinking. Lydia was the way she was, and there was nothing any of them could do about it, as had been made abundantly clear by her behaviour. Do you remember her first lost tooth? Mr. Bennet directed his inquiry to Elizabeth. She was convinced she was becoming an old woman, and wished me to glue it back into place. He laughed at the memory before his eyes began to mist. He made quick work of his handkerchief as the others pretended not to notice. Elizabeth placed her hand on her father's arm. When he looked over at her, she smiled weakly, hoping to convey that she understood how difficult this must be and that he had her sympathy and understanding. She was unsure of her success.' 
Chapter 7 Elizabeth retired early, and once she had her night clothes on and the maid had been dismissed, she curled under the covers and opened her letter from Mr. Darcy. My dear Elizabeth, your uncle has graciously agreed to send this letter, but I dare not test his patience or your father's with an overly long missive. I must begin by saying how dearly I love you and how much I miss your sweet smile. I became quite spoiled by seeing you every day in Derbyshire. To be denied the succour of your presence seems almost cruel. I found Mrs. Young, the woman I told you, may have news of W.'s whereabouts. She had been in contact with him and, for a price, was willing to tell us where he could be found. It was late when I received the news, so I will go to Gracechurch Street first thing in the morning and inform your father and uncle. I imagine your uncle will throw her over his shoulder and carry her out if she does not wish to leave with us. If he does not, your father will. I do not wish to distress you, dearest, but I wish us to be honest with one another always. Your father is greatly distressed. He seems a decade older than when I last saw him. If you know of anything I might do for his relief, please tell me and it will be done. I cannot imagine what his horror will be in finding his daughter in such a situation. The address is not in a good location. Regardless of why they have been residing there, it is not up to Miss Lydia's usual standards. It has been a long day and my bed calls to me. I will give this letter to your uncle on the morrow to include with his own. I hope to see you soon, my love. Yours, F.D. Elizabeth clutched the letter to her chest and sighed. He loved her. He truly loved her. For what else could induce a man, a man of Mr. Darcy's standards no less, to suffer such mortifications for the sake of her family's respectability? Only a man in love would bear such mortifications for her sake. She could not know what he had seen in the dingy inn Lydia had been staying in, but she could imagine, based on the state of her sister's dress and hair, she had never seen her so filthy. Mr. Wickham was likely worse, and seeing him must have brought up awful memories. With another sigh, she climbed out of bed and sat at the writing desk. Dearest Fitzwilliam, I am sorry you have had to endure such indignities as you have— I am grateful beyond measure for the kindness you have shown my poor sister. She does not know it yet, but you have saved her from a life of misery. Some day soon I must devise a way to thank you properly, but for now know that you have the heartfelt thanks of both me and my family. I think I have come to know you well enough, to know you will not wish for my thanks, but you have them just the same. I will say that while I am grateful, it is far from the strongest feeling I have toward you. I am so very proud of you, Fitzwilliam, proud that you took on such a distasteful task for the sake of a woman who did not have the sense to appreciate you sooner, proud that you handled it all with such grace and restraint, Proud that you did not waver when difficulties arose, but you held your honour and mine quite remarkably. I am proud to know you, and proud to court you, and most of all, proud to be loved by you. I wish I was with you now to offer comfort, but that day is not yet here. I will send this letter to Darcy House first thing in the morning, for I have come to London with my aunt. If you wish to see me, I will be happy to receive you in Gracechurch Street. I promise to offer whatever comfort I may sneak past my relations. I remain yours, E.B. She sanded the note and addressed it. She would send it with a boy first thing in the morning. Early the next morning, Darcy was sitting in his dressing room, being shaved when there was a knock on the door. 
His valet answered and returned with a letter in handwriting that had him instantly smiling. This is just come for you, sir. He could hardly keep his face straight in order to complete his shave. As soon as he was alone, he tore into the letter. How was it that Elizabeth knew exactly what he needed to hear? He could imagine her sweet smile, the one she reserved for when she was feeling sentimental, or he had said something that brought out that particular softness in her he so liked to see. He was humbled by her faith in him, and his chest swelled with the best sort of pride at her praise. He would leave for Grace Church Street immediately after breakfast. At the gardener's, the morning was considerably less pleasant. Lydia was stupider than even Elizabeth had thought and ignorant to boot. Mrs. Gardner had questioned her niece quite carefully, not sparing any details, to find out if she was increasing and when they might reasonably know. Lydia had never kept much watch over her courses. That was her maid's job. She had them the same time as Kitty, if that was at all helpful. Elizabeth rolled her eyes. It was somewhat helpful, as she knew that Kitty finished just as she herself was beginning, and unlike her sister, she did keep track of such things. Lydia thought she had had them recently, but could not rightly be sure, and why did they wish to know anyway? Apparently, Lydia had no notion of the signs of pregnancy, nor even a clear idea of how babes were created. When Mrs. Gardner explained as clearly as possible that Lydia might very well be increasing that moment, Lydia became hysterical. She had known she was allowing liberties. She had known she was allowing even encouraging much more than she had been told was permissible. She had known they were doing as a husband and wife did, and that she was not supposed to do so until she was wed. But in her eagerness to flaunt society's rules and be the first among her sisters to do something, she had not thought about why she was not supposed to do such things, nor what the consequences could be. Mrs. Gardner held her as she cried, and Elizabeth felt a moment of pity for her sister. Lydia was brash and selfish and unrepentant, but she was also fifteen, naive and inexperienced. Elizabeth knew she and her sisters had all been told to never let a man kiss them unless they were engaged or officially courting, not to allow him to hold her, not to be alone with a man in a secluded place or in the dark, and above all, no matter what, they were not to let a man beneath their skirts. Not his hand, nor any part of him should breach that sacred barrier, or the worst sort of fate would befall them. She should have seen that such a cryptic warning would be as a red flag to a bull for someone with Lydia's temperament. Lydia had never met a boundary she did not test, nor a rule she could not find a way around. Unfortunately, biology was not an indulgent parent, and it would have its way in the end. Elizabeth shook her head as her sister wept, feeling helpless to do anything to assist her. Finally, the maid appeared to tell them Mr. Darcy had arrived and was asking to see Elizabeth. Elizabeth walked into the empty sitting room and walked straight into Darcy's arms. He gasped briefly at the contact and pulled her to him, surprised to hear what sounded like crying. There now, love, don't cry. All will be well. She sniffed and nuzzled her head into his chest. You would never do that to me. Do what, dearest? Seduce me and abandon me to face confinement on my own. He pulled back to look at her in the eye. Of course I would not. He looked at her carefully. Has something happened with Miss Lydia? He asked, dreading the answer. Elizabeth looked down and fiddled with the buttons on his coat.
She has just been informed that she may be increasing due to her activities with Wickham. She had known what she was doing was wrong, but she had not realised it would lead to... that it was how... That it would lead to a child. She nodded wretchedly. He pulled her back to his chest and stroked her hair. That poor girl. He kissed the top of her head. My sweet darling, what a trial this must be for you. She is only fifteen. How could he do such a thing? Her lamentations gave way to tears, and she was once again weeping on his coat. Forgive me, Fitzwilliam, I am not normally such a watering pot. He wiped her tears with his handkerchief. There is nothing to forgive. It is a difficult situation. Your reaction is not unusual. She nodded miserably and led him to the sofa. Did you receive my letter? she asked. His eyes kindled and he brought her hand to his lips. I did. How did you know just what to say? She smiled shyly, and he could not resist kissing her hand again. Though it seems unfair to your sister to say so, you make me very happy, Elizabeth, more than you can know. She smiled more brightly now and squeezed the hand that still held hers. It is likely we will have to send Lydia away, said Elizabeth. I feared it would be so. Is her elopement well known in Meryton? Elizabeth sighed. Unfortunately, I fear it is. My mother was not quiet when she heard the news. The messenger arrived in the middle of the night and pounded on the door. The entire house was awakened. My father had no reason not to read the letter in front of my mother. Of course, he had no way of knowing what it contained. My mother has taken to her bed. Our servants will tell the servants of other households. And, of course, we have not been receiving visitors due to my mother's illness. My Aunt Phillips knows, and I fear she will have told her entire acquaintance before we have even returned to Longbourn. Darcy sighed and looked to the wall. She must be married, then. Yes, I do not see any other way. If my father sends her off, she will be ruined in Hertfordshire and could never return home. Has he expressed a desire for such an action? Asked Darcy, his brows raised in surprise. He has not, but I know he has thought of it. He is very grieved. I have never seen him in such a state. Darcy squeezed her hand. What do you think would be best for her? You know your sister better than I. She smiled at his sweetness. She had chosen just the right sort of man, one who would include her in solving problems within their family, one who valued her insight and believed she had some wisdom to offer. I think we must find her a husband, though... I wonder if we might engage in some subterfuge first. What do you have in mind? What if we tell everyone she has married and gone off with her husband? He could be a soldier and she could follow the drum. But in reality, Lydia would be in the country for her confinement. What would be the purpose of waiting to find her a husband? Well... I imagine a decent man might be more willing to take her on without a child in tow, and then we could find a nice family for the child and Lydia might have a better husband. One who would not resent the child that is not his own. Exactly. And I cannot think Lydia is ready to be a mother. Could she have the babe, if there is to be one, then go to the school you suggested? or perhaps another like it. She could use a different name and hopefully gain some maturity and accomplishments. Then she could marry when she is older. She knew the likely answer, but she could not help but wish. He looked at her hopeful face. He understood her concern all too well. 
The idea of one's 15-year-old sister marrying was hard to comprehend. The sort of man who would take such a wife was generally not the sort of man one would wish to marry one's sister. But her plan posed a great many risks. They could easily be found out, and Lydia herself would have to wish to go to school and maintain her anonymity, and he was fairly certain she did not wish it. Do you think your sister would go along with such a scheme? Could she adopt a new name, live for years on her own without returning home, and adapt to school life? Elizabeth sighed. I suppose you are right. She likely will not wish for it. I still wish she could marry after the birth, if there is to be one. She will be sixteen at the end of the month. And there is a great deal of difference between nearly seventeen and still fifteen. Exactly. We can discuss it, but it is very risky. We would likely need to find the man and attain his agreement to wed her after the birth, otherwise she will be known as Mrs. Brown, and then marry a man named Mr. West a year later. Yes, it is a dreadful mess, isn't it? I am sorry, my love. She rested her head on his shoulder. There is no one I would rather be in a dreadful mess with, Fitzwilliam. Your level-headedness soothes me. He smiled stupidly. He should not be flattered by such a compliment, yet he could not help the warmth that spread through him at the thought that such a fundamental part of his nature was so comforting to his beloved. It was yet another confirmation that they were well suited. I will speak to your uncle and father. Perhaps we can find a way. Do you know when we will have an idea if she is increasing? Elizabeth sighed again, hating the topic but loving the man she was discussing it with. We should know within a fortnight. That is some small relief, then. Chapter 8 The following week brought Lydia's sixteenth birthday, but nothing else. When Elizabeth began her courses the next day, that usually came after her sister's, Lydia fell into a deep despair. She cursed Wickham, for surely he had known exactly what he was about and had never intended to marry her. That fact became painfully clear when he never came to visit her at Gracechurch Street, not once. He had the direction, and he was told that if he asked Mr. Bennet for her hand, he would be granted permission to marry her as well as Lydia's portion on the death of her mother, the same as her sister's, in addition to a small allowance from Longbourn while her father lived. Wickham had declined. He asked for more, much, much more, but Mr. Bennet held firm. He would see his youngest married to a farmer or shipped off to Ireland before saddling her for life with such a man. Lydia was devastated, but her devastation lasted only an afternoon before it twisted into rage. A white, hot, boiling rage that consumed her every waking moment. How dare he abandon her? How dare he take her virtue, her pin money, her girlhood, and make her a fallen woman? How dare he make her an outcast in society? How dare he make her a mother? How dare he? She spent days pacing across her room, mumbling to herself, screaming into a pillow and pounding on the bed. She willed her courses to come with every fibre of her being. She watched and waited and prayed, but still they did not come. One morning she awoke to a rolling stomach, and it was then that she knew for certain she would not be saved. She was with child, and soon she would be a mother if she even survived the birth. Everyone would know she had been abandoned by Wickham. She thought of Harriet Forster, laughing over the letter she had left for her, claiming she would sign her next as Lydia Wickham. 
How wrong she had been. How Harriet would laugh at her stupidity, or worse, how Harriet would pity her for her naivety. As she leaned over the chamber pot and released her dinner, only one thought ran through her mind. Her humiliation was complete. Lydia crept into Elizabeth's room shortly after the sun had risen. Lizzie, Lizzie, wake up. Lydia, what is it? Lydia sat on the bed beside her prone sister. Lizzie, I want you to talk to Mr. Darcy for me. Elizabeth sat up. What? Why? I want to go away. Go away? But you will go to Northumbria. You said you preferred it. Yes, I know about that. I mean, after, after everything. I wish to go away. Where to? asked Elizabeth gently, seeing her sister's agitation. To India. India? cried Elizabeth. Shh! Sorry. Why India? It is far away and no one knows me there, and I could begin again. I will be called Mrs. Smith in Northumbria, will I not? Or some other name, yes, you will be presented as a war widow. Everyone will know I am not, but they will go along with it so they do not have to think of the truth. Elizabeth was surprised at her sister's insight, but Lydia was not wholly stupid, merely averse to using her mind. So you wish to continue being this fictitious widow and travel abroad? Yes. I thought Mr. Darcy might have a friend or cousin or someone who needed a travelling companion. He seems to know a great many people. Yes, he does. Must it be India, or would you consider another locale? I have heard the West Indies are beautiful, or perhaps Canada. I believe it is very cold there, and you know how you dread winter. Yes, of course. I do not much care where, Lizzie. I just feel so dreadfully that I must get away. Elizabeth grasped her sister's hand and squeezed tight. I can imagine. I will speak with Mr. Darcy today. Lydia nodded and slipped out of the room. Mr. Darcy called at his usual time, and Elizabeth quickly informed him of her sister's wishes. What do you think? Is it at all possible? Mr. Darcy looked dazed from all the information she had piled atop him. I suppose it is possible, though I do not know who she would travel with. I could make inquiries. Would she ever wish to return, do you think? Probably, but by then so much time will have passed that she can say she is a widow and her friends will believe her, especially if she has been travelling. Yes. Mr. Darcy rubbed his chin in thought. I will give it due consideration. Chapter 9 Mr. Bennet returned to Longbourn and announced that Lydia had married in London and was away on her wedding trip. Privately, he told his wife that she would likely not return to Longbourn for some years. Mrs. Bennet was sad to lose her favourite child but was happy to brag about the young Mrs. Westham. When Lady Lucas impertinently inquired why she was now Mrs. Westham when she had run off with Mr. Wickham, Mrs. Bennet huffed and told her she must have heard the name wrong, for it had been Mr. Westham all along. His father had a small estate in the north of England, and they would return there after their wedding tour. Some believed her. Most did not, but without evidence to the contrary, and with Jane's very eligible marriage in the offing, the Bennets were slowly restored to respectable society. The day after Mr. Bennet's return, Mr. Bingley proposed to Jane. He was horribly ineloquent and bumbled quite embarrassingly, but Jane did not care. She accepted him before he could finish his jumbled speech, and they sealed their engagement with a kiss. Mrs. Bennet chose that moment to search out Jane in the garden, the garden she seldom visited, and began screeching with joy. 
Mr. Bennett was applied to, and Bingley's suit was given his blessing and approval. All agreed a marriage within a month's time was just the thing to take the neighbourhood's mind off Lydia's recent misadventure. Jane wasted no time sitting down and writing a letter to Elizabeth, who was staying in town with the gardeners, to beg her to return and stand up with her. Elizabeth sat in the garden behind her uncle's house, reading Jane's letter. She was very happy her eldest sister would be wed to Mr. Bingley. Jane deserved all the happiness in the world. She was filled with joy for her sister, only... Why had Mr. Darcy not yet proposed to her? He had called on her nearly every day since she arrived in London a fortnight ago. She had told him he had a chance to win her heart, agreed to court him formally, told him she would love him greatly. Why did he hesitate? Was he waiting to ensure the situation with Lydia truly resolved before making their connection permanent? She did not like the thought, though she could not blame him. He had Georgiana to think of, and she would be coming out soon and searching for a husband of her own. Mr. Darcy would not want anything to upset her chances of making a good match or having a successful debut. Though, having met Georgiana, Elizabeth did not think the girl would wish to make a debut at all, let alone a successful one. She sighed. There was no use wondering about it. She would simply speak to Mr. Darcy when he came for dinner that evening. Darcy arrived on time, as he always did, and Elizabeth was about to ask him to join her in the garden. She did not think she could sit through dinner with all that was pressing on her mind, when Darcy himself disturbed her plans. I've had a letter from my great aunt today. Oh? What could possibly be of interest to her in such a letter? Did he not realise she was bursting to speak with him? Yes, she is my grandfather's sister, though she was the youngest of the family. She is 67 now. Hmm? She has written to ask my assistance in planning a journey. Elizabeth turned to him in surprise. A journey? Yes, he said with bright eyes. She had hoped to leave this autumn, but she fears they will not make it far before the cold weather sets in. Now she wishes to take the winter to plan and set off in April. Elizabeth quickly did the math in her head. If they were lucky, Lydia would have delivered her child in time, but babes were not known for punctuality. What if she has not delivered before the journey begins? She wishes to depart at the end of the month. I may be able to delay her a few weeks. Lydia will need time to heal. Oh, so my aunt says. She sighed. I feel woefully unprepared to help her. I remember very little of my mother's confinements, though I remember my aunt being tired for months afterward. Of course she had the babe in the house crying at all hours of the night. Yes, your sister may recover quicker if the babe is being cared for elsewhere, and she is very young. Elizabeth blushed repeatedly at the realisation she was discussing such things with Mr. Darcy. Yes, her youth may aid her there, but Fitzwilliam, what will be done with the babe? I have been thinking about it, and I know the father is a blackguard and the mother a silly girl, but it will be my niece or nephew. I do not feel right sending it to the orphanage or having it permanently fostered out. Did your father not tell you? Tell me what? We are trying to find a home for the babe. He will reach out to an old friend from Cambridge and I will ask my vicar. I know of a rector, around forty years of age, with a wife around thirty, but they have not been blessed with children. His living is in Yorkshire, about fifty miles from Pemberley. And what is fifty miles of good road? He smiled. I will wait to contact him in the event your sister loses the babe. It is still very early days, after all. I would not want to raise their hopes if nothing is to come of it. <laughs>
of course, it is terrible of me that I almost wish you would lose it. I feel awful even thinking it, but it would be the easiest thing for everyone involved. Poor Lydia is beside herself with fear and worry over the pregnancy and the birth. It could kill her. He stroked her cheek gently. I know, my love. It is not easy for anyone, let alone someone as young as your sister. We must hope her youth will see her through. Her youth is what got her into this mess, Elizabeth grumbled. He smiled. It is an unpleasant situation, to be sure, but it could be a great deal worse. How could it be worse? She could be married to Wickham, and the worry you feel now would never end. Fitzwilliam, she sighed. How do you know exactly what to say? He smiled crookedly at her. I have not the faintest idea, for I generally say the wrong thing. Perhaps your charm is influencing me more than I thought. She shook her head. I doubt it. Perhaps you are merely becoming more comfortable with me. His eyes kindled. I am that. How could she have doubted him? He was clearly as devoted to her as he ever had been. If he wished to enjoy their courtship before becoming engaged, she would not deny him. A few nights later, Elizabeth woke to the sound of retching. Lydia had been increasingly unwell since they first suspected she was with child. Her stomach was upset for hours each day, and for more than a week now, she had been unable to hold down food. Even a sip of water caused her to retch. Her aunt gave her tea to help with her stomach, but it reappeared after only a few minutes. Elizabeth rose and put on her wrapper, then tiptoed across the hall to Lydia's room. Her sister was on the floor, pathetically draped over the chamber pot as she emptied the meagre contents of her stomach. Lydia, it's me, Elizabeth whispered, not wishing to startle her. Oh, Lizzie, I'm so very wretched. Elizabeth looked at her with sympathy and rubbed her back. Lydia had always been one to exaggerate, but Elizabeth had seen enough the last several days to know her sister was very ill indeed. What can I do? Go back in time and tell me not to run away with Wickham? She bit out. Elizabeth choked on a laugh. I would if I could, my dear. She rose and went to the basin, soaking the cloth and wringing it out. She placed the wet cloth on the back of Lydia's neck. I would make this end if I could, Lydia. Lydia rested her head on her arm and sighed. Is this the punishment for my sins? What? This endless illness? Is this what I get for running away? for stealing Kitty's shoe roses and Jane's bonnets and never listening when you and Jane told me to act more ladylike. Am I being punished? Elizabeth's heart ached for the pain in her sister's voice. Yes, Lydia had been an awful spoiled beast and an unkind sister at times, but did she deserve to pay for that immaturity for the rest of her life? Did she not deserve an opportunity to learn from her mistakes and do better? I do not think you are being punished, Liddy. I think, she said slowly, choosing her words carefully, that you are being given an opportunity. To see how many dresses I can shrink out of before I waste away and die? Elizabeth laughed. At least you have not lost your sense of humour. Lydia snorted. No, I think you are seeing the error of your ways. You were headstrong and you believed yourself to be right always, no matter how many people told you differently. Is this supposed to make me feel better? You know you have been frightfully selfish. Elizabeth nudged her with a teasing smile. But you may have a new beginning.' 
Yes, your new life is scary in that you will know no one, but that is also very freeing. No one will know Lydia Bennett. You will not be the youngest of five sisters. No one will have heard of Longbourn. You may reinvent yourself if you choose. Lydia's expression showed confusion and a glimmer of interest. Have you never thought about it? Who you would be if you had no one expecting you to be yourself? No, of course not, Lydia cried. Why would I wish to be someone else? Elizabeth shrugged. It can be exciting to imagine someone else's life. You could try it. Lydia looked thoughtful, and Elizabeth helped her back into the bed, noticing how thin Lydia had become. She kissed her sister's forehead and slipped out the door, tossing and turning for an hour before she fell asleep. The next day, Lydia came down for breakfast but did not attempt to eat anything. Elizabeth had not seen her in bright light for a few days, and she gasped at her sister's appearance. Lydia's normally bright complexion was dull and pale. Her eyes were sunken with dark bruises beneath them, and her dress hung off her loosely. She must have lost at least a stone in the last fortnight. Good morning, Lydia. Did you sleep well? she asked gently. After you left, I was able to sleep a few hours before this morning's bout began. Mrs. Gardner looked at her with sympathy. I know it is awful. It will not last forever. A few more weeks and it will pass. Elizabeth knew her aunt well, and she could not help but notice that Mrs. Gardner did not look entirely convinced herself. After Lydia had gone to rest by the window, Elizabeth approached Mrs. Gardner. Aunt, I am worried about Lydia. Have you ever seen someone as ill as she is? I know it is typical to be sick, but this seems excessive. Mrs. Gardner sighed. You are correct. It is quite excessive. I spoke with a discreet friend of mine. I told her I had a cousin who was desperately ill and asked if she knew of some remedy. Her information was not encouraging. What did she say? She had a friend who was similarly ill, and she became so sick that she fell asleep and would not wake, and after a week in such a state, she died. Elizabeth gasped. No! Mrs. Gardner nodded grimly. I am afraid so. If she cannot eat or drink, she will waste away. Lydia was always a stout girl, but she is becoming a waif now. I know. She has not been able to wear my dresses for years, but they would fit her now. In another week, they may be too large. Yes, I am worried for her. Something must be done, but I know not what. If we were in the country, I would feel better speaking to a midwife. They have more access to herbs and remedies. But here in the city, I fear the care is more medical and less practical. Elizabeth nodded, not sure what her aunt was referring to exactly, and not sure she wanted to know. Will you go driving with Mr. Darcy this afternoon? Yes, he will call for me at three. Do you think he will come to the point soon? I do not know. I nearly asked him about it, but then I decided I did not wish to rush him. If he wants to take his time, why should I deny him? Her aunt gave her a sly look. It has only been three weeks since you arrived in town. He is hardly dragging his feet. Ah, but it has been six weeks since we came to an understanding at Pemberley. Mrs. Gardner nodded, wisely deciding not to say more. Enjoy your drive, dear. Chapter 10 Darcy arrived in his coracle at precisely three o'clock. 
Lydia had insisted on trimming Elizabeth's bonnet. It had taken her thrice as long as it normally would have, but she said Elizabeth must look her best for her beau, and her sister was touched by the gesture. Elizabeth skipped down the front steps to greet the gentleman just as he hopped down from the curricle. She gifted him with a bright smile and he returned it, reaching out for her hand. He kissed her knuckles and looked at her with such warmth in his eyes that Elizabeth flushed crimson. Good day, Mr. Darcy. Good day, Miss Elizabeth. His eyes twinkled as he helped her up, and she couldn't help the nervous giggle that escaped her. Mr. Darcy seemed in an ebullient mood today. He settled on the seat beside her, and she turned to face him, eyes sparkling. Where are we off to, my love? she asked brightly. Darcy dropped the reins and stared at her with his mouth agape. A minute passed, and then another. She finally reached out and pressed his chin up to close his mouth. Are you well? She gathered the reins and pressed them into his limp hands. Mr. Darcy? What did you call me? I called you Mr. Darcy. Before that. She looked at him in confusion, then realised what she had said. Oh, I called you my love. He swallowed thickly. Am I, Elizabeth? Am I your love? Her eyes widened in surprise. Of course you are. Did you not know it? You never said. Did I not? No. Are you certain? I am quite certain. I would remember you telling me you loved me. She looked at him quizzically. Well, I did not say that exactly. I merely called you my love. He opened and shut his mouth silently before seeing the teasing glint in her eyes. You will be the death of me, woman. She laughed gaily, then fixed him with a soft smile. You know I love you, do you not, Fitzwilliam? I love you more than I ever thought I could love a man. Truly? Truly. He kissed her hand again and snapped the reins, the horses pulling them merrily along. It wasn't long before they were on the outskirts of the city, then out of London altogether. Where are we? I care not, said Mr. Darcy. He reined in the horses and turned to face her, gathering her hands in his and raising them to his chest. Elizabeth looked at him in surprise, wondering what was happening. Mr. Darcy had a very earnest look on his face, one she had not seen since... Oh, dear. Elizabeth, holder of my heart, would you do me the very great honour of becoming my wife? Now her mouth was hanging open. He gently pressed her chin up as she continued to stare at him, Finally, a broad smile took over her face and she flung herself into his arms. I thought she would never ask. He held her to him and laughed until his shoulders shook. Shall I take that as a yes? Yes. She pulled back enough to kiss his cheek. Yes. She kissed his nose. Yes. He grabbed her face between his hands and met her eyes with his. Suddenly all the laughter left her body and she watched in slow motion as he moved ever closer until finally his lips were on hers. She was melting into him and sighing in pleasure. He was firm and strong and ever so dear to her. We will be married, she said with a smile. Yes, we will be the happiest couple in England. We will. Just think, you will no longer have to call on me. Soon, I will be just down the hall when you want to see me. His eyes brightened. Even closer than that. He pulled her close enough to miss her blush and held her tightly against him. I cannot wait to marry you, Fitzwilliam. Nor I to marry you, Elizabeth.
By the end of the day, Darcy had secured permission from Mr. Gardner, again, and sent a letter to Mr. Bennet. They had spoken when the older man had been in town, but Darcy liked to observe the formalities. Elizabeth sent a letter to Jane and Darcy sent one to Bingley. They both wondered if sharing the other couple's wedding day would be a possibility. Bingley and Jane's wedding was only three weeks away, and it would be terribly convenient. Elizabeth asked Jane what she thought of the scheme and eagerly awaited a response. By the second day, Mrs. Gardner had made an appointment at the Modiste to begin purchasing the wedding clothes, and they pored over fashion plates and magazines in search of inspiration. Darcy began suggesting locations for wedding tours to Elizabeth. They considered merely staying at Pemberley, but Elizabeth longed to travel, and, having seen Lydia's travails, she was afraid this time before she had a child might be her only chance. They decided on the Lake District, and Darcy began making inquiries to secure them a house. Lydia was happy for her sister, a sign of her newly developed maturity, and Elizabeth went to bed with a light heart. She would be wed within the month, and Lydia would travel north once her stomach settled. Elizabeth would visit her sister after her wedding trip, and, difficult though it was, Lydia seemed to be growing from the experience. It had been a difficult time, but they were coming out on the other side now, and she knew happiness awaited her with open arms. Chapter 11 Four days after her betrothal, Elizabeth was awakened late in the night when she heard a crash. She sat up in bed suddenly alert. She listened carefully and heard Lydia's voice small and pained. She threw on her wrapper and raced across the hall. Lydia had knocked over the pitcher and there was a puddle on the floor in front of the washstand. Lydia was on the floor beside it, her legs folded beneath her and her arms wrapped around her middle. Is it your stomach, Liddy? Lizzie, something is dreadfully wrong, she whispered. She looked up at her sister with frightened eyes. In only the last few days, Lydia's cheeks had hollowed out and her skin had turned ashen. Elizabeth had a brief feeling that she was seeing death trying to claim her sister, but shook it off. Let's get you into bed, she said with determination. She helped her sister up, Lydia leaning on her heavily. The moonlight filtered in through the open curtain and Lydia looked ghostly in the light. Elizabeth could not bear to see her sister's visage and looked down. That was when she saw a spot on the front of Lydia's shift. What is that? She peered more closely, then, fearing she knew what it was, she looked over her shoulder at the back of her sister's shift. Lydia, you are bleeding. Am I? she asked weakly. Then Elizabeth watched in horror as Lydia's eyes rolled back into her head and she fainted into her sister's arms. Elizabeth caught her as best she could and cried out for her aunt and uncle. There was no use trying not to wake the house now. They had to save Lydia. They had to. What followed were several restless hours. Mrs. Gardner said Lydia was losing the babe. She then whispered that it was a blessing in disguise, for growing it had been killing Lydia. Lydia herself remained senseless throughout the night, but they were able to drip water into her mouth with a cloth, and she showed no signs of retching. The midwife said she had seen such things before. If the mother woke soon and took nourishment, she should be well. If she did not wake soon, then there was little they could do. Elizabeth paled at the pronouncement, and her aunt took the remaining instructions. The midwife left them with a bottle of something they should get Lydia to drink when she woke, and told them she would call again in a few days. Poor Lydia! How could this happen? whispered Elizabeth. 
She needed no answer. She knew exactly how everything had happened. Lydia had been spoiled and indulged her entire life and never taught that there were consequences to her actions. Because she was never told no, she believed she could not be wrong. Because she was constantly praised, she believed the words of a practiced seducer. Of course she was beautiful. She had been told so her entire life. Of course she was preferred over her sisters. Was she not her mother's favorite? Wickham had preyed on her like a doe in the woods, and she had not even had the sense to run from him. Nothing in her upbringing had prepared her for such a man, and nothing in her nature would deny herself what looked to be a bit of fun. She had no concept of danger, of consequences, of society's censure. She had not seen that which she did not wish to see, much like Mrs. Bennet. Elizabeth had seen this trait in her sister. She had lamented it, been embarrassed by it, and scorned it. But she had said nothing to her father until Lydia was invited to Brighton, nine months after she had come out. Why had Elizabeth not spoken sooner? When they first spoke of Lydia coming out, she could have told her father what she had observed in her sister, expressed her concerns that her mother was the last person who should chaperone a girl such as Lydia. It might not have made a difference. He might have dismissed her as he had done in summer, but at least she would have tried. At least she would have known that she had done everything she could. Elizabeth shook her head and slunk into her room. Her aunt was sitting with Lydia, and Elizabeth wished to get a few hours of sleep. She was supposed to go shopping with her aunt that afternoon for her wedding clothes, but she could not. Not until Lydia was awake. Is Miss Bennet well? Darcy asked, his voice low and urgent. Uh, yes, sir, but she was up all night and is still abed, said the housekeeper. I am here, Mrs. Riggs, said Elizabeth, as she entered the parlour. She was a little pale, and she knew there were blue circles beneath her eyes, but she was awake and dressed. Very well, miss. The housekeeper left them, and Darcy rushed over, taking her hands in his. My dear, what has happened? There is a great cloud over the house. Lydia lost the babe in the night. He started. It was very difficult for her, and she has fallen into a deep sleep. We do not know when she will awaken. He tugged her to a sofa and sat beside her, her hands still held tightly in his. I am sorry, my heart. Is there anything I might do for you, or for Miss Lydia? Elizabeth sighed, and it all came out. Her dark thoughts in the middle of the night, her fear for her sister's life, how terribly ill Lydia had been, and the concern over what would become of her now. Darcy listened quietly, stroking the backs of her hands, and proffered his handkerchief when needed. He requested tea and added a splash of brandy to it, despite the early hour, and encouraged her to drink and eat, even if it was only a little bit. What shall become of her now? Everyone in Hertfordshire believes her to be married, but there is no husband. Mr. Wickham has run off to America, added Darcy. America? I could not have him on English soil, Elizabeth. He would forever be a thorn in our sides. Please understand. She stroked his cheek. Of course I understand. I am merely surprised. How very gallant of you. Thank you, Fitzwilliam. That eases my mind. He smiled and leaned into her hand, letting his eyes fall closed for a moment. I do not know how I would get through this without you, my love. He smiled happily at her, and she picked up her teacup to cover her deepening blush. What do you think we should do next? The cottage in Northumbria is no longer required. Is it possible for Lydia to travel earlier than anticipated?' 
I wonder. Darcy trailed off. I have an idea, but I do not know if it would work. Allow me to send a few letters. I will let you know as soon as I have something. It was a long day and a longer night, but the following morning, Lydia awakened. She blinked her eyes slowly and looked about the room in confusion. Where am I, Lizzie? Elizabeth had dozed off in the chair next to the bed, but at her sister's voice she jolted upright. Lydia! She grasped her sister's hand and nearly fell on her in her excitement. You are alive! Lydia looked about in confusion. Should I not be alive? We were very frightened for you. Do you remember the last few days at all? Lydia scrunched up her face in thought. I recall being horribly ill and thinking I would never stop being sick. Yes, you have been very ill. She rubbed her hand over her belly. It is gone, isn't it? Elizabeth looked at her compassionately. Yes, you have lost the babe. Lydia took a deep breath and looked at the ceiling. Is it wicked of me to be relieved? Elizabeth fought the tears building in her eyes. No, my dear, it is not wicked. I would like to have a child one day, but I do not wish for it now. Of course not, dear. You are only sixteen. We are not medieval. Lydia laughed breathily. I am glad you are here, Lizzie. I don't know what I would do if I were alone. Elizabeth grasped her hand tightly in hers. You are not alone, Lydia. Lydia smiled weakly back, then fell into a peaceful sleep. Chapter 12 Mr. Darcy had stayed away from the house in order to give the family privacy, but Elizabeth had just sent him a note asking him to take her for a drive if he was available. He nearly laughed at the absurdity of the question. Did she not know he would make himself available any time she desired his company? He arrived at Gracechurch Street ten minutes early and rapped smartly on the door. Elizabeth answered it herself, already wearing her bonnet and gloves. She quickly took his arm and led him back down the stairs. I take it you do not wish me to greet your aunt? She is sitting with Lydia and my uncle is at his office. He helped her up into the curricle and she settled in restlessly, her posture awkward. He gathered she wished to be away and led the horses down the street before asking... Is all well, Elizabeth? As well as to be expected under the circumstances. Oh, Fitzwilliam, please forgive me my odd behaviour. I just needed to be out of that house. She covered her face and shuddered, and he feared she might cry. But then she dropped her hands, straightened her shoulders, and took a deep breath. I will be well enough. Please do not judge me by my current behaviour. I am not myself. He placed his hand over hers where it rested in her lap. I would not dare. She smiled weakly and leaned her head on his shoulder. Where shall we drive today? If no one will miss you for some time, there is a pretty lane a few miles from here. We might even stop and walk a bit if you wished. She sighed happily. That sounds lovely, dear. He felt a warm contentment swell in his chest and kissed the top of her head where it rested on his shoulder. They drove in silence for some time, then eventually Elizabeth spoke. It is such a trying situation. Lydia wishes she could simply go home and pretend that nothing has happened, but her elopement from Brighton was well known and her marriage was recently announced. There is no going back for her. No, there is not. She understands that, but she does not like it. Understandably so. I have never seen her so subdued. She is almost another person.' 
difficult experiences can change us. She turned to look at him. Do you have personal experience? Unfortunately, yes. She slipped her hand through his arm and pulled herself closer so that they were indecorously close on the bench. Would you like to tell me about it? He sighed. It is nothing as dramatic as your poor sister. When I was eleven, my mother grew ill. I later realised it was due to her expecting Georgiana, but at the time I was terribly worried. My father later told me he'd had no idea how frightened I was, and that had he known, he would have explained it to me. She squeezed his arm and pressed closer. Eventually, her state became clear, and I understood why she was so tired and ill, but I did not stop worrying. She was delivered safely, and Georgiana was a delightful baby, but it had sapped her strength. She was well enough for a few months, but that winter, when Georgiana was only five months old, influenza swept through Pemberley, and she did not survive. Oh, Fitzwilliam. She rested her head on his shoulder again and pulled his arm to her in an odd simulation of a hug. I am so sorry, my love. That must have been devastating. By now they had left the city behind and were on a lane that had few other carriages or carts. He pulled the curricle to the side and turned to face her. He traced his fingers down the side of her face and twisted a curl around his finger. You are very sweet, Elizabeth. She tilted her head to the side. Do you think so? I do, he said with a nod. At least, you are sweet to me. She laughed. And I hope to always be so. She cupped his cheek and stroked her thumb across his jaw. I wish I could comfort you better. If you were one of my sisters, I should embrace you until you felt better. I am not against such an action. Her face showed her surprise, but then her eyes darted about, and seeing nothing but a farmer's cart trundling away from them, she swiftly stood and sat across his lap, her legs dangling toward the centre of the curricle. She wrapped her arms tightly about his shoulders and pulled him to her, one hand reaching up to stroke his hair. Darcy was shocked. No, shocked was too gentle a word for how he felt in that moment. He had been teasing, well, mostly teasing, when he suggested she embrace him. He had not thought she would actually do it, nor had he thought she would be so bold as to sit on his lap and on the side of a country lane. But then he realised how stupid he was being. No one knew him here, and if they were observed by someone who recognised him, they would be wed in little over a fortnight. Thus resolved, he crushed her to him, his arms wrapping tightly around her middle and his face buried in her neck. It was sweet to be held by her. He had not been granted many such liberties as they had not had a very private courtship. But soon his thoughts shifted from the fact that Elizabeth, his Elizabeth, was embracing him to the notion that he could not remember the last time he was embraced in such a way. His family was not very demonstrative, and while he and Georgiana were close, they generally greeted each other with a kiss on the cheek and nothing more. When she was smaller, he had read her books and held her, but since she left for school, they had not been as affectionate with one another. She had returned a lady, and it had not felt as natural. To his great astonishment, he felt tears welling in his eyes. Had he truly been so starved for touch? Elizabeth leaned back and looked at him searchingly. My sweet love, you have not been embraced in some time, have you? How did you know? She smiled sadly. Your set does not seem very affectionate.
he released a strangled laugh. No, they are not. He looked away. I was more so before my mother died. She and I were very close. My family says I am much like her, though I never thought so. She was very sweet and gentle. She often read to me, and we had tea together each week. Every Tuesday at three, I would come to her sitting room, and she would ask me about my studies and my friends, and we would spend an hour or two, just the two of us, before she had to dress for dinner. He smiled shyly. I remember when I was very small. I could not have been more than seven. She would let me choose her jewellery. I was fascinated by the old pieces in the safe in her dressing room. Sometimes she would take them out and tell me stories about them, who had worn them, who had had them made, where the pieces had come from. That sounds lovely. It was, he said wistfully. One evening my parents were hosting a dinner party, and I was permitted to choose her jewellery. I took the assignment very seriously, and I chose an enormous ruby set. The stone was large in a thick gold setting, and the bracelets were very heavy. Her Abigail had told me she would be wearing a blue dress, and I thought the blue and red would go nicely together. Elizabeth put a hand over her mouth. Oh, dear! Quite. It clashed terribly, but I remember thinking that it looked like the flag, and was that not a pretty thing? Elizabeth laughed. Did she wear it? Oh, yes. My mother insisted that she had said I could choose, and I had made my selection, therefore she would wear it. My father later told me that she got odd looks all evening, and some of the ladies wondered if she or her maid were blind to colours. But mother just smiled and went about hosting as she always did. She sounds... Like a wonderful mother, said Elizabeth softly. She was. And you have felt her loss keenly. I have. She squeezed him tighter. Oh, my love, I wish I could do more. You are doing quite enough, Elizabeth, he said gently, pulling her tighter. Chapter 13 Mr. Darcy came to dinner the following evening, and what was to be done with Lydia was the main topic of conversation. It is known she is married now. Wherever she goes, she must be known as Mrs. Westham if she ever hopes to return to Hertfordshire, said Mr. Gardiner. He pinched the bridge of his nose. Perhaps we should have waited to announce the wedding. We could not have waited any longer, said Mrs. Gardiner in a consoling voice. The neighbours had already stopped calling and no invitations came in. People were asking questions, and that is only what we know of in Hertfordshire. Who knows what may have been spread about in Brighton? The other girls would have been ruined had we not acted. I fear my aunt is right, added Elizabeth. I have had a letter from Mary detailing exactly how many of our supposed friends crossed to the other side of the street when she ventured to Meryton. Mrs. Gardiner squeezed her hand. As much as I would like to continue lamenting our situation and past decisions, we should now consider what it is we should do. Right, said Elizabeth. What do you all think so far? She cannot return to Longbourn, but now that there is to be no babe, is remaining in London an option? She looked to her aunt and uncle with a question in her eyes. I would prefer we did not, said Mrs. Gardiner, though she is certainly welcome for the time being. The servants are aware something has been going on. Only Betsy and Mrs. Riggs know the truth, and I trust them. And they have been paid for their silence? interjected Mr. Gardiner. But it is dangerous to keep her here. 
If she is thought to be married in Hertfordshire and someone sees her here without a husband, it could be disastrous. We could still consider sending her to Northumbria. If she stayed away for a year or more, might she be able to return home a widow? Elizabeth asked. I doubt most would believe it, though if she is not accompanied by a child, I suppose it is possible, said Mr. Gardiner, though he sounded unconvinced. Though not likely, added Mrs. Gardiner, Lydia is young yet. If she wishes to return to Longbourn and live a similar life to what she had before, it could be possible in two or three years. She would only be nineteen. Hopefully Mary and Kitty will have married by then, or at least one of them, and any danger to the family would be lessened. I have had a letter from my aunt, said Mr. Darcy, if we send her with a companion, she is willing to host Lydia at her estate near Liverpool. Three pairs of eyes stared at him incredulously. Truly? asked Elizabeth, hope creeping into her voice. Truly. She leads a quiet life, and they would not go out into society much, but Miss Lydia is unknown there. She could be introduced as Mrs. Westham, and no one would be the wiser. She would not even have to be a widow. We could say her husband is away with the army, said Mrs. Gardner. Darcy nodded. I dislike subterfuge, but in this instance it is the lesser of evils. So Lydia goes to your aunt as Mrs. Westham, claims her husband is off fighting the French, and she travels in the spring as we had originally hoped? clarified Mr. Gardner. Yes, I think that a workable solution. We would need to hire a trustworthy companion, but... I think it is not impossible. You would be able to correspond with her regularly, and by the time she returns she could reasonably be widowed. How long had your aunt intended to travel? At least six months, though she is considering longer. The journey is still being planned. It's certainly the best solution we have had so far. What do you think, dear? Mr. Gardner turned to look at his wife. I think it as fine a solution as any we will come across. Who should we hire as the companion? Mr. Darcy spoke first. If I may, my sister has a companion, Mrs. Annersley, who is imminently trustworthy. She wrote to me only last week to ask if I knew of a position for her sister. She was the headmistress at a small school for young ladies, but would now like to lead a less regimented life, perhaps see the world. She had hoped to attach herself to a family that planned to travel. That sounds ideal, said Elizabeth. I thought so. I believe my aunt may travel longer if she had pleasant companions, so this could be beneficial for all. Mr. Gardner smiled. Let us hope it all comes together, then. Chapter 14 Things moved along rather quickly after that. Mr. Darcy wrote to the new companion who would be interviewed by himself and Mr. and Mrs. Gardner at Darcy's home. Lydia began eating again, only small amounts at first, and she showed no signs of retching, much to everyone's relief. Elizabeth continued shopping for her wedding clothes and spent most of the day with Lydia, who was still too weak to move about over much. Oh, Lizzie, just think. Soon you shall be married. I know. I can hardly believe it, though I am sorry you will not be in attendance. Lydia smiled sadly. As am I. But when I am living with Mr. Darcy's aunt, you may come to visit me, and I will see you in all your new gowns. Elizabeth laughed. Lydia was much changed by recent events, certainly much more subdued than she had ever been, and less focused on herself. 
But she was still the gown-loving sister Elizabeth had always known. I will certainly come to visit you. Mr. Darcy is taking me to the lakes on a wedding trip, and he suggested we come visit you afterward. Lydia smiled brightly. That will be lovely. You may tell me all about the lakes. I will wish to know all about it. I will memorize every view for you and describe them in great detail. Lydia laughed, the sound much quieter than it used to be. Then her face fell and she asked softly, Do you think Mrs. Quinn will like me? Mr. Darcy's aunt, why wouldn't she like you? She knows what has happened, does she not? She does not know the specifics, but she knows there is a special situation. Special situation, Lydia snorted. Is that what we shall call it? Well, we cannot be continually referring to an elopement. Lydia's smile became bitter and she said, No, we cannot. She looked thoughtful for a moment, then said, We could call it... The Great Mistake of 1812. It sounds rather well, don't you think? Elizabeth laughed. The misjudgment of the summer. The worst decision made by a woman in the history of England. The country's most impudent man does something even more impudent. The silliest girl in England finally learns something. Their laughter faded and was replaced with sad smiles. You will get through this, Liddy, you will, and you will be stronger for it. Elizabeth stroked her sister's cheek. Lydia blinked back tears and said, And better travelled. That as well. Mrs. Button, Mrs. Annesley's sister, turned out to be the perfect choice of companion. She was well practised at managing high-strung girls and an excellent teacher. She was well equipped to teach Lydia everything she needed to know and more besides. Mrs. Button was also not without compassion. Once the gardeners were relatively certain they would take her on, they shared Lydia's story with her. She was kind and understanding, and they believed the combination of her sympathy and her unwillingness to accept nonsense would serve Lydia well. Mrs. Button was hired, she and Lydia were introduced, and plans for their travel began. Mr. Gardner and Mr. Darcy went round and round about who would pay the companion's salary— Darcy argued that he was more able, while Gardner argued that he bore more responsibility. Eventually they agreed that Gardner would pay the companion's salary and Darcy would cover the cost of Lydia's travels, which were likely to be extensive. Mr. Bennet had committed an annual sum to his youngest daughter, and between all of them, Lydia would be comfortable. Lydia gradually regained her strength and began to move more freely about the house. The servants who had not known of her pregnancy and elopement were bewildered. They had thought it likely she was increasing. Miss Lydia had not been discreet in her anger. But she was now so thin and there was no husband about and no wedding being planned. Perhaps they had been mistaken and she had been ill. Regardless of her reception amongst the staff, Lydia enjoyed her last few days of being Lydia Bennet, for soon she would be known as Mrs. Lydia Westham. She assumed her aunt would make some sort of announcement of her marriage a few months after she left in case one of her family members mentioned her married name in front of the servants. She would not concern herself with the details. Her sisters were getting married and she was starting a new life. She must keep her attention on that fact. It was time to leave for Hertfordshire. The wedding was three days away, and Mrs. Bennet's letters of late had become more and more frantic, demanding Elizabeth's presence. 
Mrs. Gardner had told her sister they must stay in town for fittings of the wedding clothes, but Elizabeth knew her reprieve was over, and she must now face her mother. Her aunt and uncle would accompany her, but not her betrothed or her sister. She said goodbye to Lydia upstairs, then met Mr. Darcy beside the carriage. I shall miss you. I am certain I will miss you more. He kissed her hand and smiled in that way that made her stomach feel as if it were dropping to her toes. Safe journey, Elizabeth. Goodbye, Fitzwilliam. He handed her into the carriage and they were off. Mr. Darcy would travel in two days' time, the day before the wedding, and stay at Netherfield. He would escort Miss Lydia, or Mrs. Westham, as she was to be known, and Bingley had agreed to place her in a guest room far from everything while the weddings took place. No one liked the idea of sneaking her into the house and hiding her from her own family, but neither did they wish to leave her in London on her own for overlong. The morning after the wedding, Mr. Bennet would escort Lydia to Gladstone, Darcy's aunt's estate, and hopefully this scandal would be behind them. Two days later, Darcy collected Mrs. Button and Lydia and set off towards Hertfordshire. He rode beside the carriage for the first fifteen miles, but a light rain forced him into the conveyance, and he found himself alone with two women he knew not at all, in a confined space. He was more than a little uncomfortable. He knew he must speak, but he could think of nothing to say. He knew Elizabeth would laugh at him were she to see him thus, but the thought did not help him at all. I wish to thank you, Mr. Darcy. He looked away from his study of the window at Lydia's quiet declaration. Whatever for? For finding me and saving me from Wickham, and from myself. Lydia turned to look out the window. I don't know what I would have done if you had not found me. I know it would have been only a matter of time before Wickham abandoned me. He was struck by how childlike she seemed suddenly. Lydia Bennet had always appeared brash and fearless to him. Her voice was loud, her clothes brightly coloured, her personality unable to be dampened by something as trivial as propriety. Now she was thin and pale. Her voice was quiet, and her eyes were more often found staring at the floor than boldly into the eyes of whomever was speaking to her. She was but a girl, and he felt foolish and thoughtless to not have recognised it sooner. You are very welcome, Miss Lydia. She gave him a tiny smile and returned her gaze to the window, and Darcy breathed a sigh of relief. At Netherfield, Darcy exited the carriage at the front door and hurried inside to greet his friend. Miss Lydia and her companion were taken around the side of the house and let in a narrow door by Darcy's valet. He led them up a set of seldom-used stairs and into a set of linked chambers that they would occupy for the next two nights. Lydia knew she could not leave her room, but the valet reminded her before he left, giving her a stern look as he would a child. Lydia found it all rather amusing. She had more to lose than anyone were this ruse to fail, and took a moment to marvel at the fact that what would have once annoyed her was now merely amusing. Trays were sent to their rooms, and Mr. Bingley was kind enough to place a selection of books for their use. Lydia was sad to miss her sister's wedding, but in less than two days she would be on her way to her new life with no one who had ever heard of the Bennet sisters. She could hardly wait. Chapter 15 the weddings were a grand success. Jane was glowing with happiness, Elizabeth was radiant, Bingley was so excited he was bouncing on his toes, 
and Darcy could not stop smiling, much to the surprise of the residents of Meryton. The breakfast was held at Longbourn, and Mrs. Bennet outdid herself, as everyone knew she would. There was enough food to feed a small army, and an endless flow of spirits. The party drew long, and finally, after nearly three hours of well wishes and not a single person leaving, Darcy had had enough. I have asked for the carriage to be brought round, he whispered into Elizabeth's ear. She smiled, her eyes warm and a light blush on her cheeks. I will make my farewells. Elizabeth kissed her sisters and mother, then said goodbye to her neighbours. Her father received a long embrace and a tinkle of laughter when he tried to discreetly wipe a tear from his eye. Do not laugh at an old man, Lizzie. It is unkind. Forgive me, father. I know it is not easy to say goodbye to so many daughters in so short a time. It is not. But I am consoled that you are going with a good man. I could not have parted with you for anyone less worthy. She went up on her toes and kissed his cheek, his scratchy whiskers making her feel like she was eight years old again, kissing her father goodnight after he had told her a story. Goodbye, Papa, she said thickly. I shall miss you. And I you, my sweetest girl. Now go, before Mr. Darcy comes to drag you away. She laughed and tripped off to meet her husband, pretending not to hear her father's deep sigh behind her. Alone at last, Mrs. Darcy. Mr. Darcy smiled and quickly pulled the shades down over the carriage windows. We are passing through grain fields, Fitzwilliam. No one will see you. We will soon pass through Meryton, and I do not wish to be a spectacle. That is a mile away. He gave her a look that told her he would just be getting started at a mile, and she flushed scarlet. Come here, my wife. He held out a hand to her. She was soon across his lap and indecorously close to him. Fitzwilliam! What? Have you not been in this position before? Yes, but that was different. How so? It was an open curricle for one. Both carriages have wheels, he reasoned. And I was trying to console you. It was not for the purpose of... of... She stammered to a halt. Of what? She glared at his laughing expression. You know what? You are quite right, dear. I should not abuse your kindness for personal gratification. Only... What? I find myself rather distressed. You do? Yes. I slept terribly ill last night, my mind full of thoughts of today. And this morning, they did not have rashers for breakfast at Netherfield. She looked at him askance. Rashers? Yes. And then, to add to my difficulties, I married the most ravishing woman this morning, but I have barely had five minutes with her. You have been by my side for hours. Ah, but we were surrounded by others. I did not have you to myself. She tilted her head. And this has distressed you? Yes, so much so that I find myself in great need of comfort. She raised a brow. Do you? Yes. She sighed, then smiled sweetly at him. Well, what sort of wife would I be if I denied my husband comfort only hours after we were wed? Exactly. She laughed gaily and wrapped her arms about his neck, one hand winding into his hair as she pulled him towards her, planting her lips firmly on his, when they arrived at Netherfield, the footman knocked on the door three times before his master heard it. Jane and Bingley eventually left the breakfast, though it was several hours after the Darcys. 
Jane snuck off to see Lydia, whom she had not seen since she left for Brighton four months before. To Jane's surprise, Elizabeth was already in Lydia's room. How are you, dearest? Jane clutched Lydia to her, rocking back and forth. I am well as can be expected. Has Lizzie told you everything? I believe so, but I would be glad to hear anything you wish to tell me. If you don't mind, I would prefer not to speak of it. Uh, tell me about the wedding. They spoke of the clothes and the flowers, who was present and who was not, who had sent a kind note or a nice gift, and how relieved they were that Mr. Collins had been unable to attend. Now you only have to get through the wedding night, Lydia teased, a hint of her old ribald humour coming through. Predictably, Jane blushed and looked to the floor. Lydia was about to tease her for her bashfulness when she saw Elizabeth's dreamy smile. Elizabeth Rose Bennet, you didn't. Didn't what? asked Jane, all confusion. Elizabeth blushed, but could only laugh at her sister's shocked expression. What? asked Jane again. Elizabeth need not worry about her wedding night, for she has already had it, cried Lydia. Jane looked between her sisters, confusion across her features. Already had it? But how? When? She flushed a deeper scarlet and looked to the floor when she realised what she had said, and Elizabeth dissolved into peals of laughter. We left the wedding breakfast some time ago, she finally managed. No, Jane's eyes were wide. Elizabeth, what is the problem? It is my wedding day. Besides, now I may relax and enjoy an hour with my sisters while my new husband takes a nap. Lydia laughed uproariously over this while Jane continued to look between them and the floor, flustered beyond anything. Dear Jane, do not worry, said Elizabeth. All will be well. If Charles cares for you half as much as Fitzwilliam does for me, you will be very well pleased. Jane flushed even darker and her sisters laughed until their sides hurt. Epilogue. Gladstone, 11 October 1812. Dear Lizzie, we arrived at Gladstone yesterday shortly before dinner. The journey was uneventful and we are all well. Gladstone is a large house, a little bigger than Netherfield and rather prettier. The gardens are lovely, even though it is October. Mrs. Quinn says they are at their prime in spring when the azaleas bloom. I shall have to wait and see for myself. We were all tired from the journey, but dinner was a pleasant affair even so. Mrs. Button seemed very impressed with the house. I did not think I would like having a companion, but she told me the most interesting stories of the girls at her school as we travelled. One actually climbed down a trellis to escape in the night. Can you imagine? I felt rather better about my own behaviour after hearing that. The housekeeper, a serious woman with a nose like a hammer, gave us a tour of the house this morning. I was perfectly pleasant, but she never smiled at me once the entire time. Though, I suppose, if I had a nose like that, I would not smile either. Once we were shown the library, Papa refused to leave it. He has been there above four hours now, and I do not know if he will ever give it up. He had planned to stay two more days before returning to Longbourn, but perhaps he will stay a few weeks. How are the lakes? Are they as beautiful as you thought they would be? Or does everyone make more of them than they ought? More importantly, how do you like being married? Is Mr. Darcy good to you? I cannot believe he would not be, but if he is not, you may tell me of it. 
I wish to confess something to you, but you mustn't tell Jane, for it will only upset her, and she should be happy so soon after her wedding. Do you remember visiting me at Netherfield on your wedding day, and Jane joined us, and we all laughed when you and Mr. Darcy snuck off to be together even before dinner? It was terribly funny, and I am smiling just thinking of it, but at the time it also made me sad, because... I never felt that way about W. He was not kind to me, Lizzie. Not like that. He never left me smiling like your Mr. Darcy leaves you. I do not think I ever truly loved him. I thought I did, and I thought he loved me, a fact I was quickly disabused of, as you know. But even after I realised he did not love me, I thought he at least liked me, that we had some manner of affection between us. Now, I believe, he was merely afraid to travel alone. He owed money to every soldier in Brighton, and he had to get away. He was too much a coward to do so by himself. What manner of man is that? He would have made an awful husband. Sadly, I am beginning to think I would have made an equally awful wife. I have been doing a great deal of thinking, and I do not think I am ready for marriage. To anyone. I am rather selfish. I know you know this, but I have only recently realised this characteristic in myself and the extent of it. Mrs. Button spoke of our doing charitable work and asked me which sort of activities I generally prefer, and I had nothing to say. You and Jane visit the tenants and take them baskets. I have heard you speak of tinctures you've made in the still room, and I know you visit tenants when they are ill. Jane has made beautiful christening gowns for the families, and even Mary takes in darning from the church. What do I do? Nothing. I am heartily ashamed of myself, and yet I do not know what I could do. Mrs. Button says we may begin with something simple, and I am sure I can learn a great deal for Mrs. Quinn. She seems a very nice lady, Mrs. Quinn, that is, and I am grateful to be here in this beautiful house, rather than hidden away in a tiny cottage in Northumbria. Please thank Mr. Darcy again for arranging it. It really was very kind of him, and he did not have to involve himself at all. It is strange, but I am also grateful for the events of the summer. I have learned a great deal about myself and about men, and I believe my life will be better for it. Your contemplative, for once, Sister Lydia. Rosewood Cottage, Lake Windermere, 18 October, 1812. My dear Lydia, we have just arrived at the lakes and your letter was awaiting me here. What a lovely welcome. Our journey was easy and the house my husband... I wonder how long it will take me to accustom myself to those words... has borrowed for us is quite lovely. It belongs to a friend of his uncle's, and he was happy to lend it to us for a few weeks. I am certain we will have to put him up in Derbyshire, should he ever venture there, but it will be no hardship. Pemberley, what can I say about it? We travelled thither the day after the wedding, as you know. The roads were dry and the carriage comfortable, and we arrived after only two and a half days of travel. F. assures me that it often takes four days in winter, and once he was caught in muddy roads, and it took nearly a week. I am exceedingly relieved such was not our fate. You know I have little patience for prolonged carriage rides. We spent a few days at Pemberley, and I met Miss Darcy and her companion Mrs. Annesley. Miss Darcy is a dear girl, and one I shall like to call a sister. With time and familiarity, I am certain we shall become good friends. Mrs. Annesley is your Mrs. Button's sister, if you recall. 
Storytelling must be in their blood because she also told us some very entertaining tales about her younger brother, who apparently was the type to get into a great many scrapes and never know how to get out of them. Ask Mrs. Button to tell you of the time her brother got trapped in the pig pen with an angry sow. But do not drink tea whilst she tells it, or you will soil your gown. I am glad to hear Papa has enjoyed the library, and though I know you jest, I think it would be wonderful for him to stay on a few more days. The two of you could do with a little time together, and Father so seldom leaves Longbourn. It could be a welcome change of scene. Married life is treating me very well indeed, as is my dear Fitzwilliam. He is everything I should have wished for in a husband had I been clever enough to know what that should be. Be at ease and trust that I am incandescently happy to be Mrs. Darcy, and I hope one day you will find such a man for yourself. I believe you are right about W., Neither of you truly cared for the other, and were both too selfish to do right by each other. But you see your folly now, and you are addressing your faults. That is very mature, Lydia, and takes a great deal of bravery. Not everyone is capable of facing their own demons. I am very proud of you, sister, and I dare say you are making great strides already. My husband is calling me. I am still not used to calling him such, and I must away. I will see you soon at Gladstone, and you may write to me before as often as you like. Your sister, Elizabeth Darcy. Rosewood Cottage, Lake Windermere, 26 October, 1812. Bingley, I must apologise again for trying to separate you from your Miss Bennet. If she is half as delightful as her sister, that was cruel indeed. We have been married only a short time, yet I cannot imagine my life without Elizabeth. How is London? Are you ready to escape the city yet? As to your last, I do not know if I am the best person to advise you. If Miss Bingley does not wish to live with Mrs. Hurst, you are well within your right to set her up in her own establishment— there may be some talk, but I doubt it would be extreme, though I am hardly well versed in the latest gossip. My cousin, Colonel Fitzwilliam, has a great many acquaintances in town. He could likely tell you better whether or not removing Miss Bingley from your home will cause a scandal. If you are tired of town life, you may join us at the Lakes. The cottage is much larger than we anticipated, and in a few weeks we will repair to Gladstone to visit my aunt and new sister. You would be more than welcome on the journey. If it is not too cold, we will go to Ireland. I would like to wait until the spring, perhaps even summer, but Elizabeth would like to go sooner. She says we should travel while we can." Do consider joining us, if not at the lakes for a week or two, at least at Gladstone. Elle would be delighted to see Mrs. Bingley, I am sure. Yours, etc., F. Darcy. Brook Street, London, 9 November 1812. My dearest Lizzie, Charles has entreated me to write to you and Mr. Darcy and accept your kind invitation to join you for two weeks at Lake Windermere before continuing on to Gladstone. Our stay in town has been eventful, and we are both desirous of a rest. We have seen a great many shows and concerts, and I have met many of my husband's friends. Most are delightful people I would like to know better— I have bought more clothes than I could possibly wear, though Charles insists on spoiling me. I do not know if you have heard, but Miss Bingley has moved into her own establishment. She was not happy living in the house with us, and she did not wish to live with her sister, Mrs. Hurst. I confess I was surprised she did not wish to live with Louisa, as they have always struck me as rather close.' 
but I have come to realise Caroline enjoyed living with her sister when she was mistress of the house. When their roles were reversed, she was less content. She has leased a set of rooms a few streets away and has engaged a companion, a very fashionable woman called Mrs. Clay. I wish Caroline well and hope she may find the happiness that has so eluded her up to this point. She and her companion seem to get on, though Mrs. Clay does strike me as rather false sometimes. I will be careful around her. It is such a joy to run my own home. The housekeeper is a kind woman and very efficient. The cook is not as good as we had in Longbourn, but I have requested some recipes from Mrs. Walters, and I am hopeful things will improve. My chambers are fashionable, but not in a colour I favour. Peach has never been a favourite, as you know, but Miss Bingley is rather fond of it, and it is all over the house. Some of the papers are salvageable, as they have only small amounts, but the drawing-room will need to be entirely redone. I feel as if I have walked into a jar of marmalade. My chambers will be done shortly, then I shall see to changes in the public rooms, and we may return to a refreshed house. Oh, how I miss you, sister. Town has been delightful, and Charles is a wonderful husband. All I need is my dear Lizzie to be perfectly happy. I have been entreated to tell you that we will leave on the 13th, and hope to arrive within a week, though there may be some delays. I cannot wait to see you. Yours, Jane Bingley. Darcy, forgive the shortness of this letter. I have merely added it to Jane's to Elizabeth, but I could not wait to tell you. I have done it. I have slayed the dragon in her lair. Caroline is living in her own establishment with nothing but the interest of her dowry and a small allowance from me, only a hundred and twenty pounds per annum before you ask. I do not recall when I was last this relieved. I would have let her stay had she apologised, but she refused to see she had done anything wrong. Really, it was beyond the pale. Who dismisses someone else's maid? It is ridiculous. Poor Jane was beside herself, and young Molly was in tears. It was dashed awkward, I tell you, and Caroline would not even apologise. It is too much. I tell you, I am glad Jane does not employ a French maid. They are expensive for one and for another. They are always trussing up the ladies like birds on a platter. I prefer my wife to look like a woman. Thank you. C. Bingley. And Caroline's maid isn't even French. The accent is entirely false. She is Lucy Banks from Manchester. The nerve. Oh, we shall arrive in two weeks' time. I'm sure Jane told Lizzie. Gracechurch Street, London, 10 April 1813 My dear Lizzie, I am so pleased to hear your news. I must agree with you that you are increasing, and judging by what you have told me, you should expect the babe in November, perhaps late October. How are you feeling? I am glad you do not seem to have Elle's illness, for it is very dangerous. I was pleased to hear Ireland was all you hoped it would be. I hope your journey to Derbyshire was not too difficult. I have always hated being in the carriage when I am with child, especially near the beginning. Have you told Mr. Darcy yet? It will not be certain until you feel the quickening, of course, but all the other signs are there— your uncle has gotten to the point where he knows almost as soon as I do now. I cannot believe we are increasing at the same time, though I suppose it is not so unusual. I believe this will be my last child. I am three and thirty now. It is not as easy as it was ten years ago with Margaret. I have been thinking of names and... I wonder if you would like to stand godmother. She will be Rose Elizabeth if she is a girl, and we like Jonathan for a boy. Do you think your husband would stand godfather? 
We will not ask if you think he would find it awkward, but it would be delightful for the pair of you to do it. I have had another letter from Lydia. She has told me all the plans of her journey, and I am quite impressed. So many locations. I thought they would be curtailed by the war, but I am assured they will avoid all dangerous areas and their boat will sail around the fighting. I will confess to a little bit of envy. I have always wanted to see the Mediterranean. Your uncle has promised to take me on a grand tour when the children are grown. You are my witness, Elizabeth. We must hold him to it. Little Eddie is begging me to read to him, so I must close. I remain yours, M. Gardner. Pemberley, Derbyshire, 25 June, 1813. My dear aunt, it is true, I have felt it. I was certain I was increasing before now, for my courses had ceased and my appetite has changed utterly. I cannot abide eggs in the morning when they were formerly a favourite, and I have a sudden desire for pickled vegetables when I cared little for them before. But now I am certain... I felt something a fortnight ago, but it was so faint I could not be sure. But I have felt him quite strongly for three days now, so there can be no mistake. And of course there is my increased girth. I believe my current dresses will do for some time longer, but by September I will need an entirely new wardrobe. I am sorry I will not be able to be with you during your confinement. Will your sister make the journey? Jane will be at Netherfield another month complete. She would come to you if you wished it. She is very calming in difficult situations. I am sure I will quite depend on her when my time comes. Fitzwilliam is beside himself with joy. When I first told him in the spring, he tried not to get his hopes up in case I was mistaken. But as the evidence mounted, he could not help becoming excited. He worries occasionally, for his mother had some difficulties before G was born. But I have assured him that I come from sturdy country stock. My mother went through five confinements without difficulty, and I am certain I shall do the same. He was much relieved by that. Is it wicked of me to say I think it may have been the first time he was grateful I have the mother I do? Pemberley continues to be the most beautiful place I have ever seen, and I find I am quite at home here now. Soon I shall love it as much as Fitzwilliam does. Give the children my love and kiss uncle for me. Yours, E. Darcy. Pemberley, Derbyshire, 7 November, 1813. Dear Mr. Bennet, it is my pleasure to inform you that you are now a grandfather. Elizabeth was delivered of a son late last night. She is doing well and the babe is healthy. He has a full head of dark hair and strong lungs. Elizabeth is resting but in good spirits and is already insisting on a walk tomorrow. We have decided to call him Bennett Fitzwilliam Andrew. He will be christened just in time to see you all at the festive season. Sincerely, F. Darcy. Bari, Italy, 10 January 1814. Lizzie, you have a son. Congratulations. Your letter took ages to arrive, so I have only just heard. But I am ever so pleased for you. I am glad the pain was not too awful and that you are recovering so well. Was Christmas with everyone pleasant? Did Mamma ask the cost of every piece of furniture in Pemberley? You needn't answer that, for I am certain she did. I miss you all, but I am having the most wonderful time. I have met a lovely family with three daughters, and they have made a great friend of me. One of them likes to paint, and she has asked me to sit for her. I was nervous at first, but once I became accustomed to it, it was not so difficult, though it became frightfully dull after some time.' 
Mrs. Button is a wonderful travelling companion. She has a great talent for sketching and has made drawings of nearly everywhere we have gone. It is a wonderful way to remember the trip. Mrs. Quinn is as delightful as ever. She is frightfully funny. She has joked many times about staying here forever, and I am beginning to think she might mean it. She does seem very enamoured of the Italian culture. You must come to Italy sometime, Lizzie. It is everything lovely. I cannot imagine a more perfect place. Mrs. Button will include a letter for her sister and Mrs. Quinn for your husband, so I will close before this becomes too large to be sent. Your sister, Lydia. Pemberley, 9 April, 1814. My dearest Fitzwilliam, you may recall that on this day two years ago we had a quarrel of epic proportions, I propose we create a new memory for this day. You will find me at the Folly on the far side of the lake. Do tell your steward you will be gone for some time, for your wife has need of you. Your loving wife. The End This concludes Letter Interrupted by Elizabeth Adams Copyright 2021 by Elizabeth Adams. This audiobook was produced in the year 2023. Copyright Elizabeth Adams. Letter Interrupted is part of three novellas in the Elopement Project. If you'd like to hear more, then look out for Foolish Games and Uncertain Endeavours.